entire life. I'm proud to continue to live and work here. And I'm here today to um, reaffirm and support um, your prioritization of diversity, equity, and inclusion in our city. I just want to um, thank you for making that a city priority and reiterate that there's no place for hate in, in my city, in our city, and I want everyone to feel welcome and included here. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Please state your name. My name is Andrew Shapiro. I'm a resident of Walnut Creek. Uh, Madam Mayor and members of the Walnut Creek City Council, my name is Andy Shapiro. I'm here tonight because, um, unfortunately, I think the voice of hatred is also here tonight, and I think it's important for us to be here. I'm here for reasons that I could not have imagined a decade ago. A decade ago, before his passing, when my father described for me what it was like to grow up Jewish amid the anti-Semitism of the pre- and the post-war period. Back then, I blithely dismissed his warnings as Jew hatred and it never goes away. However, he was merely, I thought he was merely channeling the paranoia born out of the traumas that he might have experienced 50 or 60 years ago, which were no longer a concern in these enlightened times. How wrong I am. Hatred of Jews remains lodged in the diseased minds of sick individuals whom, like all bigots, still find it convenient to blame blameless people, be they Jews, Muslims, Chinese Americans, or whomever, for their own failed lives. And it is because of that, because these contorted and demented persons have chosen to use public forums such as this, council session, to spew their lies, their and their bile, that I and my co-religionists who are here tonight sit beside me, have been here tonight. We are here because we need to be here. Jews need to be seen. And unfortunately, we need to be heard. We cannot allow such slander to go unanswered, and we will keep coming back for as long as necessary. My father never shrank from his Jewishness. He served his country through two wars. And on his headstone, below the Star of David, he had inscribed the central tenet of the Jewish people. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You see, even in his death, he wanted his Jewishness to be visible. I and these others who are here today for that same purpose. We are Jews. We are proud to be here, and we plan to remain very visible. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Right. I'm uh, Arvind Malia. Mayor Haskew, members of the council, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm Arvind Malia, and I live at 1045 Alfred Avenue. I lived in Walnut Creek for 30 years. I thought I'll get a little more than two minutes of the time here. <laughs> uh, so I lived in 30 years uh, in Walnut Creek, seven years of utter misery during the last East Bay mud expansion project. So now they're expanding it again. 35 years with AT&T, now retired, having ha awarded the highest honors, the s and Medal, for network reliability, network disaster preparedness, and man-made and natural disasters. Currently working on the Department of Defense on a classified project uh, to do with economic, social, telecom, power, water infrastructure, disruption and mitigations. Uh, so this East Bay mud project right now is a disaster in the making. Uh, none of the impacts of this uh, expansion are discussed in that EIR. This is a facility located at the top of a hill with only undivided Larky Lane, no sidewalk, T-junction with a stop sign all the way to the freeway. Uh, it goes through two schools, churches, homes, and apartments. In case of a fire or earthquake, I think we are trapped. This is basically like Hawaii. There's no other way for us. There's only Larky Lane uh, going up and down to the facility. And this is basically a traffic engineer's nightmare. Uh, the facility is also located on top of the hill. They haul chemicals all the time up and down. Okay, so it's surrounded by an open space. So the only access is, again, through Larky. And, uh, you know, there have been spills there. I've uh, watched the spills. I've photographed that. And I uh, also uh, sent it off to Cal EPA. And uh, hopefully they will respond back to me. So anyway, we ask you to include this matter for the next city council uh, meeting. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Greg Alcaraz. I've lived in Walnut Creek for two years and Contra Costa County for 60 years. We're here tonight as residents and taxpayers of Walnut Creek. 
and we oppose East Bay Mud's proposed pretreatment plant at the Akalani's Ridge. We want to make you aware of the health and safety of your constituents is being threatened, and we are requesting. Would you? Would we are requesting your assistance. Thank you. Some of the health and safety concerns are as follows. During phase one of the proposed East Bay project, there's a maximum of 136 daily truck trips coming in and out of the neighborhood. There's a maximum of 60 daily workers coming in and out of the neighborhood. Once the project is complete and at water peak uh, purification, there's estimated to be 42 daily truck trips removing the solid wastes that come from the, the cleaning of the water every day. Please note that San Luis Road, which turns into Conejo Way, has become a cut through street and already has significant traffic. The increased traffic due to the East Bay Mud Project will overload San Luis Road, additional traffic jams will occur, and increased likelihood of accidents in the neighborhood. There's also potential for spills and leaks of chemicals and other toxic products via the trucks, as well as spills that could occur in the facility. We ask you to agendize East Bay Mud's proposed pretreatment project at the next city council meeting. Thank you. Thank you. All right, here's the list of uh, people who are coming up next. Katha Flat, Flortley, Hartley. Oh, excuse me. And uh, Samantha Francois. And Luz Gomez. And Norman Matloff. Please start. Hello, my name is Katha Hartley. I have lived in Walnut Creek for nine years, happily. I'm here to thank the Walnut Creek City, City Council for governing this beautiful city with such care and dignity and respectfully. I want to commend the City Council for upholding the Constitution of the United States, especially the First Amendment, by allowing and inviting people to speak here in your meetings. I commend our city council for patiently and respectfully allowing what I consider cowardly, hateful attacks on our Jewish community by people, my guests, who have never lifted a finger to help our community or to enhance the dignity of the people who live here. I want to thank you for the dignity with which you conduct yourselves and your meeting. Most Walnut Creek city, city or Walnut Creek citizens understand the great value of our diverse community. I recall from history and my own experience as a young girl in Chicago, where I lived in an Irish Catholic Jewish neighborhood and we celebrated each other's uh, wonderful holidays. But I remember experiencing the hatred that my best friend Arlene Malkin and her family experienced from people outside who hated Jews. This is 1947, two years after the, we, we know, knew everything about the Holocaust. Uh, remember in, night in New York, 1939, 20,000 American Nazis gathered. They were defeated. And I believe that the people of Walnut Creek will defeat any kind of anti-Semitism, any kind of anti-other behavior or rhetoric here. It's cowardly. And certainly, again, I thank the City Council for the wonderful work you do. I love the city. I'm so grateful to be here. So thank you for, for everything that you do. Mayor, ask you, Council, Samantha Francois, Walnut Creek resident, 23 years. Never in my life did I think my city would be subject to racism and hate. Standing with my Jewish friends and neighbors and anyone who is othered in our community, um, standing against hate. There are lots of places that need help, lots of places that people, instead of driving here for two hours, could go and volunteer instead of driving here and spewing hate for two hours, could go and volunteer. I just don't understand it. We have literally fought a war over this. My great uncle did not sustain an injury at Normandy to see this happen again, and I will not stand by to see this happen again. Thank you. Okay, 
Good evening, Mayor Haskew, council members, staff, and community. My name is Luz Gomez, and I serve as the East Bay Mud Ward 2 Director. It encompasses Walnut Creek, Lafayette, parts of Pleasant Hill and San Ramon, the town of Danville, and the communities of Alamo, Blackhawk, and Diablo. I'm here tonight to introduce myself to both the council and the Walnut Creek community. I was appointed as the new Ward 2 representative unanimously at the April 9th meeting, just like last week, so I'm brand new. Um, and um, it's a tremendous honor to be a member of this esteemed board. Um, we settled in Ward 2 40 years ago, my family and I, and we literally fell in love with the water from the first sip we ever took. I had the privilege of visiting Pardee Reservoir last week and to see where the pristine water comes from and ends up in our tap, it was in an incredible privilege. Um, I wanna point out that jo joining us tonight, we have Dave Renstrom, who is an engineering manager, and Joe Volker, who's our community of first representatives. So as the newest member of the East Bay Mud Board, I'm eager to ensure that Walnut Creek continues to receive the excellent service and water quality that you have been used to receiving all this time. I'm immersing myself as quickly as I can in all things East Bay Mud, all the projects that are coming up. I understand that there's a project here in Walnut Creek that you guys are hearing about tonight. I look forward to working with the council and with the community on addressing this and any other project that may come up. Um, I brought with me some cards having to do with our community assistance program. If anybody is having trouble paying for water bills, I'm leaving these at the front. And um, thank you so much for your service, and I look forward to collaborating and partnering with you. Thank you. Um, wait a minute, please. Thank you very much for being here this evening, and congratulations. I watched the interviews last week, and I truly thought you demonstrated a real understanding of our communities and the issues that we face, whether they're sustainability or water quality or the challenges of infrastructure redevelopment and continuing for the future. Um, I think so you've already heard this evening that there are some members of the community who live near the water treatment plant up at the top of Larkey who have some concerns, and I assume since you brought some um, staff members with you as well, that you are prepared to talk to them outside if they so desire. Absolutely, yeah. Great, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Silva. You're welcome. Um, we, we will also finish with the public comment and then maybe have the meeting with, with the people of concern out in the hall then. Would that be? Yeah, I'll be outside waiting. Okay. Yeah, thank okay. you. And anybody that wants to can go and talk to her now, please. All right. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, my name is Norman Matloff. I've lived in Walnut Creek for 37 years. Uh, we live very close to that East Bay mud plant. Uh, we are not happy, just as the other speakers said. Um, we believe there is a real danger. Uh, we believe that there is major, major disruption coming. I don't know if you can imagine it, every single day for three to seven years, trucks coming through our neighborhood, noisy, blocking traffic, dust, fumes, every day starting at 7 a.m., not 8, not 9, 7 a.m. for three to seven years. This is outrageous. We believe there are good alternatives we do ask that you put this on the agenda for the next meeting. Obviously, we can't legislate that right here, but basically we want you on our side. I want to make three quick points for, I think, I'm running out of time. The most important one is this. This is not a neighborhood issue. It affects all of Walnut Creek. Don't dismiss it as a neighborhood issue, which we've already heard from city staff. Okay. If up there, up above our houses, there is a disaster, everybody in Walnut Creek is going to feel it. You're not going to have any water. There's not going to be water here in City Hall. Okay. Second, why so late? The uh, final EIR is due in June. Okay. Well, I'll tell you, most people in our neighborhood don't know 
We know that because we've been canvassing. And everybody we talk to, this is news Thank to them. You. Thank okay. you. Yes. All right. You, you'll have Thank a chance you. to talk to uh, I do agree with this. the speakers about Jewish. I'm Jewish. Yes, thank you. Um, let's see. Um, Emily Chang, Chris Palomo, Craig Davini, and Norman Matloff. Hmm? Oh, that's Norman Matloff. No, you don't get two, two chances. Hi, yeah. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Emily Chang. I am a longtime resident of the city of Walnut Creek, and it's nice to see all the familiar faces here. Um, some of you may remember me from when I served in the city of uh, the city's transportation commission and when I worked for the Downtown Business Association. I'm proud to be a resident of the city of Walnut Creek. There's a lot to be grateful for, uh, but tonight I wish to echo the concerns regarding the East Bay Mud um, project at Akalani's Ridge. Uh, in particular, what concerns me are the health and safety aspects. I have two children, and I'm concerned that the asbestos, the debris, and the pollutants will have an adverse impact on their health. Of course, I think the elderly are more at risk as well. We know that the council does not have a vote on this project, and we know about government code 53 zero nine one but there is case law establishing significant limitations to the code and thresholds that public entities must meet before claiming the full extent of the code and even if that weren't the case uh, what we're asking for tonight uh, will not be in conflict with that code i'm glad for the chance to perhaps speak with east bay mud tonight and i wish to also uh, request that the council consider funding an independent engineer's report to make sure that the eri data is accurate. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, Mayor, Council members. My name is Chris Paloma, and I'm a field rep of the NorCal Carpenters Union at a local 152 in Martinez, covering all of Contra Costa County. First, I'd like to thank you guys for allowing me to speak tonight. Um, sorry, my phone just went off. <laughs> um, many, um, today, I stand before you to discuss an urgent issue affecting our community in Walnut Creek and the surrounding areas. The exploitation of workers by irresponsible contractors and developers in our local housing projects. These contractors are not only undermining the dignity of our hardworking men and women, but they are also compromising the integrity of our development projects. Many of these unrepresented workers who pour concrete, frame, building, frame buildings, and build the very structures we live and work in are being, being denied a livable wage. They work long hours under challenging conditions, yet they struggle to make ends meet for themselves and their families. Furthermore, these contractors often fail to provide essential health care benefits, leaving workers vulnerable and unable to afford medical care when they need it most. Compounding these issues is the widespread practice of misclassifying workers. This misclassification strips workers of the rightful benefits and pay rates they should be receiving. These practices are not only unethical, but they erode the quality of our workforce and ultimately the quality of our housing developments. It is a disservice to both the workers and the residents of this city who will inhabit these buildings. As the leaders of this city, it is your responsibility to ensure that development within our community is both sustainable and ethical. Therefore, I urge you to enact and enforce stringent labor standards that protect our workforce from exploitation and keep developers and contractors honest. Let us be a city that values not just the bricks and mortar of our buildings, but the hands that build them. Let's ensure that our progress as a city does not come at the cost of our workers' welfare and dignity. I'd love to sit and talk with each one of you guys and talk to you guys about the crime scenes that are going on on all these housing projects. Thank you for your time. Next speaker, please. Hello, Mayor Haskew, uh, council members. Um, my name is Craig Davini. I'm a longtime resident of Walnut Creek, and I'm here with my uh, family tonight. Uh, we'd like to address the uh, hate speech that's been, uh, that's, that we've been listening to. <clears throat> we already live in a difficult time. We're facing unprecedented challenges like climate change and overpopulation. We need to be able to find common ground and common truth so that we can start working towards solutions. But in this age of the internet and social media, we are engulfed by misinformation. And instead of thoughtful, rational voices, it is primarily the complainers, the haters, and the most extreme voices that are amplified and propagated. At the same time, politics has become so divisive and extreme, we've lost our middle ground. 
Sometimes it feels like we're so divided and dissimilar. How will we be able to rise to the challenges of the day? And then in our own city council meetings, the ugliest, most ignorant, and toxic members of society stand here at this podium spewing hate, prejudice, and anti-Semitism. These speeches are so disheartening. And in combination with everything else going on could make someone lose faith in humanity. But after witnessing the response from our community, I've left with, I'm left with a very different emotion. I feel hope, optimism, and empowered. I was moved, I am moved, by the outpouring of support from this community. In response to the hate, we've heard messages of love, kindness, and empathy. I'm convinced that when faced with adversity, our better angels will prevail. This terrible thing has entered our community, and as a result, we've only grown closer, found common ground, and emerged from it stronger on the other side. Our goodness, our compassion, our empathy are our strongest emotions. And though we face many challenges, when called to task and faced with adversity, we will rise to meet the challenges of our day. Thank you. Let's see, um, Ryan Masanu, um, Guy Sterison, and Alyssa Lawson. What I'm about to say <clears throat> will shock many, and that's because we've all been brainwashed from birth. Time to take your children out of public schools and colleges, throw away your television, stop watching movies, stop listening to the radio, stop reading newspapers and magazines, and get off social media except for Gab. Television, radio, and movies have been run by those who follow the Talmud since they were invented. My website is MasanoNews.com. I also have my own radio show, uh, Ryan Masano show on Speak Free Radio. So if anyone has a problem, come on my show. I'll, I'll listen to you. Let's talk about the Jewish Talmud. If you're a woman and you're not a Jew, according to the Talmud, you're a whore and a prostitute. And by the way, I've got three million views uh, for Sacramento. Thank you for what you're doing. You're going to bring uh, millions more. If you're a woman and you're not a Jew, according to the Talmud, you're a whore and a prostitute. If you're a man and not a Jew, you're an animal and a beast. The Talmud says the best non-Jews deserve to be killed. It also legalizes child molestation, homosexuality, murder, lying, cheating, stealing, deceit, transgenderism, and much more. Now we have five vict or four victim groups in America listed in order you cannot criticize them. First are Jews, and you could tell. Se thank you for the demonstration. Second are homosexuals and transgenders, and I see the rainbow flag. Third are non-whites. Fourth are women. The w media says white men are racist, but any mistreatment of whites cannot be racist. Of course, the response of Jews when you criticize legitimate Jewish wrongdoing is to holler, Holocaust. Now, whether it happened or not is worthy of consideration, but let's give our Jewish friends the benefit of the doubt. If the Holocaust happened, Jewish communism also happened, murdering 100 million. So why do we constantly hear about the 6 million alleged victims of a Holocaust, but rarely about the 100 million murdered by Jewish communism? Because Jews control the money and media, that's why. Talmudic Jew bankers took control of America in 1913 with their bogus Federal Reserve Act and the 16th Amendment, Income Tax, and 17th Amendment. I'll end there. Please. There, were, there was another speaker. Mayor, uh, city council members, I know you've seen me here before. I'm here for a reason. I'm here to encourage the city workers as well as people in the community to carry Narcan. Uh, I am currently at I work at Sacramento County Coroner's Office, which is the ME's office, and we've seen a real influx of people coming through there that are very young from fentanyl. And Walnut Creek's a beautiful city, and there's no, you guys really don't have a lot of problems, but drugs are funny. They come under the radar. A lot of people don't think that these homeless people are doing fit and all, and they don't, and they think the normal person, you know, you would think would not do it, but it is a killer, and it's rampant all over the state of California. I encourage your city workers that work for public works or any of those departments to carry 
Narcan. The police carry Narcan. All of you guys need to carry it because you could save somebody's life, seriously. There is a lot of people going through the ME's office right now that are very young and it's very sad and it's because of this problem with fentanyl. So I encourage you people to possibly get the city to take a budget and buy Norcan. It's very inexpensive. You don't need a prescription for it and you could save a human person's life. I would appreciate it if you, in your agendas moving forward, that you could possibly uh, talk to your city workers about it. It's very important. We need to save lives. Too many people are dying. Thank you. Yes, Melissa, is that you coming up? Yes. Elisa Lawson, good evening. Uh, Walnut Creek resident since 2011. I just moved from an unincorporated area to an incorp uh, incorporated area, and I chose to stay in Walnut Creek because I love this city so much. I hate public speaking. I should, sorry, I should not use that word tonight. Um, I dislike <laughs> public speaking, um, but I was motivated um, because I, I really am um, upset about the, the hate speech that we've been hearing. Um, I just wanted to stand tonight and say that I'm in support of a community in Walnut Creek that is inclusive, diverse, uh, equitable, and I appreciate your efforts. Uh, I have another card from Lynn Finger. Uh, my name is Lynn Fanger. I Lynn, am Lynn, Jewish. Would you I... move the microphone so it's near your mouth? Okay. Thank you. Okay, my name is Lynn Fanger. I am Jewish and I reside in the La Mirinda area and I'm almost in Walnut Creek every single day. I thank the Walnut Creek Council for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight and appreciate all the work that you have done to help with all these horrible remarks, anti-Semitic remarks. Yes, we do have freedom of speech, but with that said, in my opinion, Freedom of speech comes with responsibility. I am speaking for all, on behalf of all the people who are not here tonight to speak up against this disgusting and hateful rhetoric against the Jewish people. This is not to be accepted or tolerated in this community. Anti-Semitism is not new. This trope does not define who we are, nor does it threaten us. It is unnecessary harassment by a stupid group of people. We do take this seriously because we are a minority and the highest targeted religious group. This is a call out to stop all kinds of racial hate. So please, whoever you are, keep your comments to yourself. Thank you. Anybody else? We have one minute left for public comment. Yes? Don't forget to fill out a card before you go home. Go. Yeah, come. Hi, um, my name is Erica Beth Dahl. Go ahead and record me because you've recorded everyone else. And I just want to say that, um, you know, I live in Concord, but I lived in um, the Bay Area, Alamo, Walnut Creek for many years. And um, I was horrified when I found out what happened specifically, I guess it was in fe February, to a wonderful man um, and council member, Mr. Wilk, who I had an honor to meet the other day. And I am here to say that I will be here and others in our community who will continue to stand up to this vile display that does not represent who we are as a community. Regardless of me living in Concord, I feel this is my home too. And we are all community members together. And just one last thing I want to add. There's some heavy research that's being done by some of my colleagues who are working on this effort and on other efforts jointly, and come to find out that members such as the man who stood up before to make a spectacle, they actually make money off of doing this by Go, uh, go Fund Me sources on the dark web. You, you, I'm not being interrupted. I'm letting you know that that is actually true, 
and we have receipts to show that. And maybe hey, hey. my next time I come to speak, I'll talk more about how when the videotaping goes on for themselves and for others, they make money off that on the dark web. All right, it is the end of public comment. I have a comment to make. Every council member has taken an oath to follow the Constitution, including honoring the First Amendment rights afforded to us all. Nevertheless, the speech today, full of threats and inappropriate language, um, in my opinion, borders on yelling fire in a darkened theater. While under the letter of the law, you may have the right to be disruptive, disrespectful, and dreadful, dreadful to listen to, but we have the right and obligation to vehemently disagree with your comments and choose not to be bullied and instead focus on communications that improve and bring progress to our city. To be clear, the council strongly disagrees with and condemns your comments. Um, thank you all for showing up and um, I have, Kevin, please. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. And I appreciate those comments, as does the entire community, Jewish, Muslim, black, LGBTQ, everybody. Uh, some things that I have privy to that other people may not is the amount of feedback and comments and emails and people that just stop me in the street or in meetings telling me how thankful they are to live in Walnut Creek, how welcoming it is. Thank you to the city council for doing the things that we have done to make people feel more welcome and for also speaking out against the hate speech that we've heard. While we've heard from a couple of terrible individuals over you know, the last couple of months, we've heard from hundreds and hundreds of people, both in the public sphere, as well as just in the last few meetings who have shown up. We've heard from dozens of speakers, many of them not Jewish, many that are ministers that are Catholic and Christian, Episcopalian, and a variety of different people that say these, are, these people align themselves with why Christianity, no, we rebuke what they're saying. Some of the comments that we've heard, the, that these haters are not just divisive, which we know they are, they're ugly, toxic, disgusting, ignorant, hatred. These are just some of the words that we've heard tonight, and there's many more that have happened over the last few weeks. As a community, it heartens me to see this kind of support and outreach that we've heard from the community. Many people who have spoken, I can hear it in your voices, many people who have spoken, they're not comfortable with public speaking. This may be one of the first times they've spoken in a long time, maybe ever in this kind of a forum. We've all become used to it. But it's a real challenge if we think about what it was like the first time we ever had to speak up in class or the first time in front of a large group of people. It can be intimidating and it's, it's nerve wracking. And these people have gotten up and out on a Tuesday night to come to Walnut Creek to a electrifying city council meeting <laughs> to be able to speak their truth and what it means to them. And I thank you for that because I think that that's important because as we've heard from many people along the way, including Winston Churchill, who I'll quote on this, thing that evil exists where good people say and do nothing. It's not that the opposite of love or the opposite of hate is love. The opposite of hate is indifference. And we have to show that. We have to show how important it is, it is for us to stand up. All the people that have spoken tonight and all the people that have spoken to me in the last couple of months are all from a five mile radius. The two specific haters and dividers that have spoken in Walnut Creek at our city council meetings the last two months have come from Stockton and Modesto. Maybe Sacramento, I'm not quite sure. It's not, it's those two. They've had to come from at least an hour, an hour and a half away to spread their vile hatred here. And we have shown that we are better than that as people, that we are better than that as humanity. And I thank God every day that I live in Walnut Creek and that we are a community that accepts and loves one another, and I thank everybody for being here, I thank people that are watching, and I thank everybody in the community for being as welcoming as you are.
Yeah, whoa, 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 we don't, I'm sorry, I was, I was otherwise occupied. Um, we don't clap in this, that, that is not appropriate. Um, I guess you can do that. Um, this is a business meeting and, and we intend to run it like a business meeting. And uh, that being said, public comment is closed. And uh, we're- Can I get um, staff, just get some information on, um, we have some neighbors in one area near the East Bay Mud water treatment plant. And could we get clarification on why we are not taking this up at the city council level and what our level of authority is? Yeah, in, I can. in English, <laughs> not lawyeries, please. <laughs> yeah, I can provide some thoughts to the council. Um, so the, the city is under, by state law, does not have jurisdiction over this project as East Bay Mud's facility is a water treatment facility and by state law, um, as one of the speakers mentioned under the government code um, and by attorney general's opinion conclusion that she does not have jurisdiction over that project. And as is East Bay Mud is the agency that's undertaking the project, it is also the lead agency on the environmental document so it has the responsibility to approve, uh, prepare, review, and certify the environmental impact report. Um, the city can comment on that report, and the city has done that um, prior to the public comment period closing. Um, and so, um, you know, the city has taken steps to, to review and respond to that comment on that environmental analysis. But otherwise, the city is not, um, it's not within the city's jurisdiction to issue a permit, a CUP, or building permit, or otherwise. Thank you. Any other comments before we move on to the next item? Seeing none, uh, we are up to, I'm looking Close at the session. Closed session, thank you. <laughs> I started to say that. Uh, closed session announcements, are there any? No announcements, Mayor. Thank you. Um, city manager reports. And um, in case you noticed, this is not Dan Buckshy. This is Kevin Safine, who um, who now kind of is also in charge of arts and rec department. And before he opens his mouth, I'm going to <laughs> I'm going to bring the um, local news Sunday paper where there is a giant headline saying arts and rec expanding its adaptive inclusion programs and two people who are very active in making that happen are here one of which is Kevin Safine our, our substitute city manager so thank you and um, Ms. Orcott who also um, has been a mover and shaker in this whole thing now city manager report Thank you, Mayor. I was just going to say what you already said, which is uh, I am not Dan Buckshy. Uh, <laughs> uh, the city manager is uh, out of town this week. He will return, a scheduled return on Thursday. So I'm your acting city manager. And then I'm also presenting an item later. So you will see me over at the lectern a little bit later and then coming back here. So I'll be on the move, but I just want to share that with you and the audience that um, uh, city manager Buckshy will return on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you. Any, anybody on council would like to take take wing here. Matt, would you please? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this morning, I had the pleasure of attending the State of the Chamber talk over at the Oakview Room at the library, where we were able to hear an update on the Chamber's strategic plan and also celebrate outgoing Chair Audrey G and welcome back uh, incoming Chair Matt Gouchard. We had an interesting report from Visit Walnut Creek. That's our visitor bureau, a visitor and tourism bureau, and they had interesting statistics in terms of the economic development that happened as a result of a half marathon run that was scheduled in early March. I was signed up to run that race and unfortunately got canceled due to weather conditions on Mount Diablo but uh, there, everyone had, was already in town for the race and they had um, some good numbers that, that that one race over that two day event uh, garnered something along three quarters of a million dollars in economic uh, development uh, for the region. So great news on, in terms of sports tourism and more to come on that. We also at that event celebrated legacy members of the chamber, meaning they had been members of the chamber for 50 years or more I think that's right, including Cal Shakes, 
uh, Diablo Valley College and CSAA Insurance Group. So thank you to them for being such valued business partners and members for many, many years. Uh, then this uh, earlier this afternoon, along with the mayor, I uh, attended the public education committee meeting, and we had an update on the seat at the table initiative, which is for our uh, an initiative our youth leadership commission brought to us two years ago now and asked us to do a pilot program where three youth members serve on our arts, transportation, and park recreation and open space. So those youth members now have served almost two years and have done a really fantastic job. I watched one of them in action at, at the Pros Commission meeting and she was prepared and she had great comments and really contributed to the dialogue. So this will be a future council agenda item where we'll talk about the future of, of that program since it was a pilot program. I believe that's coming back to our, to, it'll come on our May uh, agenda. And then finally, I attended the East, uh, the Economic Development Working Group Committee of the Chambers meeting last week, where we had another report from the Diablo Valley Tech Initiative, which is a group of uh, business folks, city folks, entrepreneurs up and down uh, the 680 corridor who are trying to promote and garner new interest in development in tech and economic development within that region. And their first their first initiative now, or one of their major initiatives, is gathering data on the industries that are here, the industries that we would like to hear to be here, the, our employment base, so that we can make strategic decisions going forward in terms of trying to be attractive places for new businesses. We also talked about the city's economic development action plan, which I know we'll get an update on at our next, or one of our future council meetings. The Shadelands rebranding project, which we're all familiar with. And then um, a scheduling of a technical advisory panel uh, with the, the Urban Land Institute, which is actually part of our economic development action plan. Those are a lot of words in all those words. Um, and. That will be a focused study by the Urban Land Institute in conjunction with kind of our business partners here, focused on healthcare and the future of healthcare in not just in Walnut Creek, but in our region and how we can be well positioned to be an attractive place for additional healthcare development. And I think that's it for me. Thank you. Hey, okay. I'm going to just roll right up. I guess that's me then. Mm -hmm. A uh, few things that happened in the last couple of weeks. One is that as the representative for County Connection, uh, Contra Costa County Transit Authority, wanted to mention a couple of things. One is that there's a Senate Bill 1031, I know that our mayor must be familiar with uh, being on CCTA, which is essentially that there is a bill that it's a it's Wiener, uh, what, actually, what, Wahab, uh, yeah, Wiener Wahab, Th that is uh, looking to consolidate all the transit agencies that are under under one umbrella, basically have it one large bus system, which would not be efficient. Sounds efficient, it's actually not when you get into the weeds of it. BART is not supporting it, just wanted to put that out there. Uh, I was part of the group that went to Washington, D.C. last week to meet with our legislators, several different Congress members, DeSaulnier, Eric Swalwell, uh, Garamendi, talking about the grant funding that we're looking to hopefully continue to have the federal support on. There's a lot of different clean energy initiatives that we're working on when it comes to public transit, including electrification of buses, but also hydrogen fuel cells. And there's a large cost for infrastructure in that, but it's a cheaper cost afterwards. So there'll be more to come on that, but that grant funding, of course, is always going to be necessary to be able to get, get the bus rolling, so to speak. Uh, I did want to mention that there's the Bedford Gallery opening that I was at this last weekend, Rediscovering Native America. And I've got, to be honest, I just don't know that much about the Native American culture. You know, it's interesting. I, I think in fifth grade they teach that. But oddly enough, I've been around the world and I haven't really, I don't think I've ever even been to a, a reservation in America. And seeing all these art that's there at the Bedford Gallery really makes me want to go out of my way and get to a reservation to really see what's going on there as well. But it's fascinating. So I, I definitely recommend uh, visiting that while it's still open. I had the opportunity yesterday to meet some of the most enthusiastic people I have ever met in my life. 
I spoke at the Tice Valley School first grade class. <laughs> and there is nothing like seven-year-olds that want to ask every question of the sun. And it wasn't just about, hi, who I am. It was more about they're looking to try to be, have first grade involvement in their student council, and they wanted to ask a council member, how can they make that argument, and why is it important to be part of the decision making process? So I was happy to have that conversation, and the first time in my life that I ever said, I've been a representative of yours in Walnut Creek for their entire life. <laughs> I haven't had that opportunity before. Uh, and then we have the Cal Cities Leaders Summit in Sacramento this week. I believe a couple of my council members are going with me on that one. And uh, this Saturday is Earth Day at uh, uh, Walnut Creek is celebrating that in Civic Park. A few of us are speaking at that. It starts at 11 o'clock. Not sure when it goes until, is it three? Mm, I think it's, it's four. two or three, but come at 11. Mm -hmm. That's my report. Thank you very much. Um, just to build on what you said about the Bedford Gallery exhibit, it is a photography exhibit. It is beautiful, and it's running through June 23rd. So you have a few weeks to get in there because you could spend two to three hours just studying and reading the um, placards on each of these photographs. And it really is reflective of all of, I would say, west of the Mississippi River. So you can see um, people who are from uh, tribes out of the Lakota tribes out of the, the, North, the Dakotas and the um, Colorado and New Mexico and Arizona and the Pacific Northwest. So it's really interesting and really informative and beautiful photography. So check it out. Um, <coughs> council Member Francois and I represent this council on the board <laughs> of the Central Contra Costa Solid Waste Authority, which is euphemistically known as Recycle Smart. We take care of the trash, the recycling, and the organic waste. The um, subcommittee of that is looking at various pieces of legislation that are running through Sacramento right now, looking to take positions on these bills. One of the bills in particular that we're particularly supportive of would create expanded markets where um, our communities could acquire their required compostable products, organic waste. We have a big requirement as a community to basically purchase and use mulch that has been um, through the organics processing. And so we're very supportive of that. Also what's happening is there are a number of pieces of legislation that in an attempt to reduce waste are really seeking to make um, the producers or the manufacturers of products that are difficult to dispose of to be responsible for the end of life. And that would include not only mattresses and textiles, but also things like um, EV charging batteries and pho photovoltaic cells, all of which end up just in our landfills with good uses during their life. But then it's how do you properly dispose of those and not have them in the landfills. I will mention that the Association of Bay Area Governments Executive Committee is meeting this Thursday evening. I'm a member of that board, and we will be having a robust conversation about the possibility of putting an affordable housing bond package on the ballot in, in November 2024. This would be for the nine counties, and it would generate billions of dollars to reinvest in affordable housing across the nine counties. So stay tuned for more information on that. and. Um, I would mention that I attended the um, annual fundraiser for the California Symphony on Saturday evening, and I really want to congratulate them for working to generate funds to support the work of the California Symphony, who is a phenomenal professional orchestra with one of its homes here in Walnut Creek at the Lesher Center. And I think the next performance is focused on Brahms, because I saw that card in the mail. And um, finally, I will mention that Community Service Day is October 12th. That's a Saturday, 2024. And the recruitment project for projects. So we first have to find local groups to sponsor projects. And then we turn around. And now once we get a catalog of projects, then we turn around and recruit volunteers. So we're looking for nonprofit schools, other public agencies, sports teams, um, service clubs, and the city, of course, to um, create projects for this year. Again, Saturday, October 12th. Be sure to mark your calendars. Thank you, Mayor, very much. You're welcome. 
Okay. So I won't repeat the Bedford Gallery smashing exhibit, uh, state of the chamber, interesting, lots of data. Um, I did want to talk about um, the mayor and I, and I think Council Member Silva showed up at, um, for the Habitat for Humanity. We got to welcome some of the new families. Oh, and Kevin was there too. Yeah. You weren't there. Yeah. I was in yourself. I know. You were. I, okay. <laughs> you, I was in yourself. And I was anyway. way in the back, and she noticed me from a distance. Well, you had a bright colored raincoat on, and it was a very cold day. But we got to meet a bunch of the families that are moving in. They've all worked a couple hundred hours on their homes, and they are, as a group, super excited about moving to Walnut Creek. There were two of them that were coming from San Leandro, and they met because they were walking around their neighborhood, and one of them had a Habitat hat and they figured out that they were gonna be neighbors and they were super excited to be here. Um, I also, um, I miss the regular um, groundbreaking or ribbon cutting ceremony for the John Muir Cancer Center because my husband and I were off hiking in Patagonia and so Sharon Jenkins from John Muir came back and said, well, you know, for you two, we'll give us a personal tour. So we got the personal Sharon Jenkins tour of the new cancer facility and it was just really great how much they thought about the patient and the families and the care that they were giving to them as they came up with that center. And last but not least, um, because this person was not at, the Walnut Creek Library Foundation Authors Gala has a spring um, reception for the sponsors. And this year, like always, we have it at um, up at Teleferic, graciously hosted by Brian Harahara and I just he was not there that night and I just wanted to say thank you for inviting us all and entertaining us in grand style it was a great kickoff to the library uh, fundraiser which is coming up in two weeks and now I will turn it over to the mayor to explain what a Luella is <laughs> okay well I wasn't going to start with that but um it was in this very seat I uh, stood up uh, when they were looking at building the plant uh, the Habitat for Humanity um, houses, there was a little problem of five feet um, to, uh, and a conflict with our ordinances. And we went round and round and round and round and the neighbors were not happy because there was gonna be this new development in the thing and they were using that as an excuse. And so it was from this very chair that I stood up and I said, I am five feet tall and you can know how little that is because you can see I'm almost the same height as everybody sitting down. So I said, let's not call it five feet. Let's call it a Luella. And I think after that, uh, the vote was made and the houses were built and it's all very well. I did ask to have it, my name put on at least one building because I, I had an a impact. Um, Seriously, um, I also on CCTA and I had the planning commission and uh, we spent some time um, talking about increasing for ferry service up and down um, from Richmond to Hercules to um, farther in the, in the, down the river and uh, what it could be and what it would look like and how much it would cost. Um, also related to Contra Costa Transportation Authority, I'm on the Innovate 680 uh, uh, program and they spend a lot of time talking about timing uh, when you're getting on a freeway and those annoying red lights, uh, they've, they've figured out how to use them very efficiently and there's new technology and they will be going in. And the third of my transportation jobs is TransPAC and that's the local um, five city uh, group who um, comes up and uh, we decide how to spend uh, Measure J money, which is a half cent sales tax um, that was that we pay for um, because we voted it in. Anyhow, um, that that we heard the second half of the applicants for getting um, accessible transportation funding so that they can. Um, they can um, move people who have challenges who are old or um, and some of them are volunteers and some of them are recognized bus transportation. So we have the job of figuring out how to allocate our money. Um, I got to be on the Diablo Regional Arts Board and I went to their board meeting on Monday, yesterday. And uh, they've got some pretty exciting things. Of course, they have their annual fundraiser 
but they're also going to be doing a lot of things about um, spreading culture around the community. And uh, they have a, a floating, well, floating, it's a truck um, that, that drives around and, and, and there can be performances at schools and other places so that we can reach out. Um, and then they have their giant fundraiser in the fall. Um, I, I, we, we presented some awards for our employee recognition, but I also want to say that we recognize people who have been with our, commu our, our staff um, from five years uh, to 25 years, and it was impressive, and it warms my heart how really dedicated our staff is at delivering services and taking care of our community. So um, I believe that's it, and I have had an indication that somebody would like to take a 10-minute break. So before we get on to the next two items, we will take a 10-minute break. I'll see you back here at 7.35.
Thank you, and welcome back to our city council meeting. And the next item on the agenda is, uh, I need to turn my page. I put my glasses on my face. Uh, the approval of the assessment reports and annual levy of assessments for the downtown Walnut Creek Business Improvement District, a bid, and the downtown Walnut South Business Improvement Improvement District S bid for fiscal year 24 25 and setting the public hearings. Hi. Good evening. Would you tell me who you are? Good evening, Audible Mayor and City Council, Angela Sway, Economic Development Manager. Uh, tonight's item 5A is the annual renewal of the downtown bid and S bid. The downtown Walnut Creek bid has been in place since 2005 and the South bid uh, since 2010. The bid and SBID are managed by uh, Walnut Creek Downtown, uh, which plays a key role in promoting and preserving the downtown as a vibrant and successful uh, destination through its events, marketing, and beautification efforts. As a reminder, in 2022, your city council adopted an automatic annual increase of 3% to the assessment amount each fiscal year beginning July 1st of 2023. And at this time, there is no additional increase being proposed above the 3%. The annual bid and SBIT assessment renewal is a two-step process. The first meeting is tonight uh, with a pres presentation from WCD, and the second meeting is the public hearing. And now I'd like to introduce Kathy Hemingway, the Executive Director of WCD, to give a brief presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Haskew and City Council members. I'm Kathy Hemingway, Executive Director with the Walnut Creek Downtown Association. I'm here tonight to share the organization's annual report for fiscal year 2023-24. Um, looking forward to um, and ahead to fiscal year 24-25. The Walnut Creek Downtown Association is a nonprofit um, made up of 680 um, downtown businesses. Um, the map here shows our district boundaries, um, and the bid and the south bid encompass 29 blocks of the downtown. Walnut Creek Downtown leverages the bid assessments to uh, the bid assessment fees to increase the visibility and vitality of the downtown. And these funds, together with sponsorship, support, and event uh, revenue, pay for a wide range of projects and activations. And Walnut Creek Downtown um, Association acts as an advocate on behalf of um, our business members uh, through beautification projects, special event production, coordinating um, marketing and professional development opportunities for our business members, and member advocacy. This is a list of our board of directors and current staff members. Our board um, directors participate in a variety of committees as well um, to help engage with their constituents um, through programming and um, their constituents programming and staff. And our staff currently consists of three full-time members and then um, three part-time employees. And we just recently welcomed um, a part-time intern from DVC. So Stephen Doe now has joined our team. Our member advocacy efforts uh, are accomplished through a variety of ways that are listed here. Um, a couple of these items to note um, include the development of a vision plan that we've been talking about. We're just about to sign, um, hopefully with a, um, an agency to assist with um, creating a vision plan that will create goals and uh, tangible tasks to enhance the downtown business district and the organization through focus groups, memberships, and um, resident outreach. And then another item of note is that Walnut Creek Downtown um, has a, is a member of the California Downtown Association and the International Downtown Association. So both membership organizations provide programming, organizational, and networking benefits for our staff to, uh, to connect with professional place management uh, leaders throughout the world. Um, so I personally sit on the CDA Board of Directors and um, recently um, participated in a lobby day up in Sacramento um, where we attended the Downtown Recovery Committee hearing followed by meetings with state senators and assembly members um, discussing topics such as retail theft, clean and safe, and entertainment zones. 
all while representing the priorities of the downtown business community. And these are examples of our community programs that are occurring for one to six month timeframes. The uh, downtown stages, arts around August, painted pianos. We've got painted pianos actually will be, a new set has been delivered as you may see, they'll be painted this Sunday. So more to come for the 24 um, season. And then I'd like to highlight two programs funded by the Measure O Sales Tax Initiative. Um, additional programs that we've um, managed throughout the year include the inaugural year of uh, holiday decorations throughout the downtown. So those, um, those efforts were funded by Measure O to help brighten the downtown with seasonal um, decorations and lights. And then another project is the Big Belly Wraps. So we've been working with the city's um, public art manager and the Bedford Gallery staff um, on this project, um, which will install artistic images onto over 50 uh, Big Belly units within the downtown. So we'll soon be conducting a public artist call and plan to complete this project in early uh, summer. And annual programs that include, our annual programs include business networking and annual public events. Um, the very popular um, Walnut Creek Uncorked will take place uh, again in June this year. And then also um, the, the Broadway Plaza Summer Concert Series are always a very popular um, program that takes place in August. And these are highlights of our late summer and fall events. And this past year, we um, had the return of Oktoberfest to Civic Park East, which welcomed over 12,000 guests. A winter highlight um, was the return of the Civic Park Holiday Tree Lighting Ceremony, which was attended by over 200 guests. And um, the return of Walnut Creek on Ice for its 19th season welcomed 23,000 skaters. And a new rinkside experience with fire pits um, that was added to continue the, to enhance the visitor experience. This is a snapshot of this year's uh, marketing statistics. And in addition to a very successful digital campaign um, in 2023, we coordinated co-op ads providing special rates for downtown business members to advertise in Diablo's weekly A-list. And then we also created an, a co-op ad for the East Bay Women's Conference featuring eight downtown restaurants promoted to all attendees before and during the program. And this slide shows, um, moving into our finance, financial review, this slide shows the um, final budget for fiscal year 2023-24 and the projected budget for 24-25. You'll note there is a small deficit for um, this past fiscal year. However, our current sa savings can cover that amount. So I wanted to point out too, with the next couple of slides, they will include the past year's comparison using uh, numbers from uh, 22, 23. So currently our um, AR total for the fiscal year 23, 24 is approximately $11,000. Just kind of take that into account. And a couple of notes. Um, on this table. The reimbursements portion um, includes items that were purchased in advance by Walnut Creek downtown, with the largest expense being the holiday decorations um, for this year. And overall, 23-24 um, performed better than the previous year in, in almost every category. And the continued success of large-scale events have um, required an increase in event supplies, professional services, and rental equi uh, equipment. So you'll see a bit of a jump there. Um, alternatively, our team is re currently receiving bids to, um, for equipment rentals to identify one vendor to supply all of our events. And the need for contract labor and volunteers also grew to assist um, with the larger programming. Um, and this part of this need was filled through um, a partnership with the Trinity Center, providing employment for some of their, um, their members. And our streaming, we're streamlining administrative costs and staff roles um, that has begun um, this, this year to address rising expenses. And now that we see that our programs are, are, um, prog our programs are stabilizing post-pandemic. 
and the positive trend that we're also seeing is a, a significant increase in revenue from our ticket sales, um, sponsorships, um, which have provided some revenue growth um, to help offset our increasing operating expenses. So our programs for the year continue to see a positive growth um, in for Oktoberfest, Walnut Creek on Ice, and First Wednesday. Um, and again, because of the sponsorship support and guest confidence, which has continued to, to slowly come back post-pandemic. I've listed a few highlights here for the proposed 24-25 budget. Um, the assessment review is projected to be $303,000. $100,000 resulting in a net uh, income of approximately $273,000. In, uh, and we anticipate uh, maintaining uh, general marketing and payroll expenses in the year ahead after we've invested in these areas over the last two years as we've been rebounding from the pandemic. This is just a table of the assessment fees um, reflecting the 3% increase. And then we are excited to share a full slate of programs for 2024, bringing thousands of visitors to the downtown. And uh, due to popular demand, we'll see two first Wednesdays that will occur in 2024. Um, last year's event was a great success, and we're going to be hosting um, the first event on May 1st, and then the second on August 7th. We'll be bringing this program um, to Locust Street, so expanding that beyond our um, Cypress Street um, footprint, which um, was definitely busting at the seams last year. So we're hoping for a cooler um, day, because last year was beyond. Um, and we're um, excited to be able to um, work with the city on um, Locust Street as we're, they're wrapping up construction. We're going to be um, taking over Locust Street for a little bit to bring some fun to that, that street. Um, Oktoberfest, um, this lists a, some efforts to update and fine tune this year's program, which is scheduled for uh, September 27th and 28th. And the 2024 um, season, event season kicked off with the Spring Fling, which many of you may have um, either attended or seen, had seen many kids running through the downtown. So we co-hosted with the Walnut Creek Education Foundation, um, and they were are celebrating their 40th anniversary year, and uh, they asked us to assist with bringing back one of their more popular events. Um, kids of all ages participated, families participated um, by performing in choral groups and bands, sharing their artwork on um, city sidewalks, volunteering as guides, and um, as event support. Oops, sorry, I want to go back real quick and address summer arts in Walnut Creek. We're going to be tweaking um, arts around August to include a... Um, a three-month program or expand to a three-month program. So all the arts programs occurring between June and August will be showcased as a rebranded program called Summer Arts Walnut Creek. We'll be, um, the marketing guidelines will be um, sent to all of our partners to implement within their own collateral. Um, we're featuring a new logo that should be done within the week. And then program dates and information will all be uploaded to our um, website calendar um, to be, again, used as a main resource for um, information. And then our staff will be assisting with the marketing coordination and the um, Arts Alliance group has decided to move beyond um, uh, um, employing a coordinator. So um, our team will be dividing up those duties. And then the ice rink, real quick, um, we'll be back um, for um, hopefully a little bit longer season. Um, we are reviewing um, some different alternative, a few items that we hope to expand um, the to the venue, which includes beer and wine service and potentially a new um, features for our younger, even younger kids to enjoy. So more to come on that. I did want to note that um, we will not be hosting um, the spooktacular um, trick-or-treat event. Um, this year, our team, the last couple of years, our team has partnered with the Arts and Rec staff to produce the Boobash Halloween event, um, and it's become one huge event within the downtown. And while the trunk-or-treat event in Civic Park continues to grow and thrive, 
<clears throat> excuse me, we've all made the decision to discontinue producing the spooktacular stroll, which goes throughout the businesses. Um, we found that a six hour um, Halloween event within the downtown just wasn't as effective as the three hour um, event within the park um, that also accommodates three to four th times the amount of people. So while this dis this decision does eliminate um, a one of our longstanding programs, we are definitely committed to supporting um, the Arts and Rec Department with pr um, promoting their, um, or supporting the Arts and Rec Department with promoting their program and engaging downtown businesses so they can still have a, um, a place at the trunk or treat. And then a um, new effort in 2024 is to create a 501c3. The Community Partnership for Walnut Creek Downtown is going to be a new endeavor for our organization. Its, its mission is to develop, support, and promote artistic, cultural, and public events that benefit businesses, individuals, and stakeholders within the service area of downtown Walnut Creek. Um, applic an application is in process, and um, we will keep you posted on um, the developments of that um, new endeavor. And overall, um, we are continuing to streamline our efforts, our administrative and marketing programs, um, which now are resulting in a savings of approximately $10,000. Um, one of the efforts we um, have been able to identify is upgrading our, our website, and we'll be able to provide more services um, and engagement for, to our downtown businesses. So that concludes my presentation, for, um, and thank you very much for your time and support, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Ah, I just please. have one question. I might have missed it, but was a movable feast on there? No, we are not going to return with movable feast. We oh. saw a, a very, um, a, a big dip. drop off. Yeah, yeah. Darn. Yeah. A and they had a couple of a couple different things between the school um, calendar changing, um, and I just think that there was just a lot going on in August, which is great. But um, we have our efforts that are going to be concentrated elsewhere. Okay. But we appreciate <laughs> all of the council members that led um, each of those um, evenings. They were very popular in that respect. Thanks, Kathy. Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, so let's bring it back to public comment. Or, yes, is there any pu public comment at this moment on this topic? OK. Um, so we do, I'm bringing it back to council, and we do have some um, actions that we are expected to take. Um, and. That would be the uh, resolutions that are outlined in our agenda report. So who would like to embrace what the job is? I would like to move to approve the resolutions approving the downtown Walnut Creek Business Improvement District quote unquote bid annual assessment report for fiscal years 2023-2025. Also the adopt the resolution approving the downtown Walnut Creek South Business Improvement District SBID annual assessment report for fiscal years 2023 to 2025. Adopt the resolution of intention to levy assessments for fiscal year 2024 and 2025 for the bid and set a public hearing for May 7th, 2024. And adopt the resolution for implementation to levy assessments for the fiscal year 2024 to 2025 for the S bid and set a public hearing also for May 27th, 2024. Second. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote? Mayor Pro Tem Darling. Aye. Councilmember Silva. Aye. Councilmember Francois. Aye. Councilmember Wilk. Aye. And Mayor Haskew. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. And we are all so happy that downtown is coming back from COVID. <laughs> yes. Okay. That finishes that. And we're on to the next item, which is the new aquatic and community center at Heather Farm Park. Action on Aquatic Sustainability and Essential Services Options. Good evening. 
Mayor Haskew and members of the City Council. My name is Janine Cavalli. I'm a senior planner here at the City of Walnut Creek. And I'm very much looking forward to presenting to you this evening on the new Aquatic and Community Center at Heather Farm Park. Um, I am joined by other members of our project team, and <coughs> including both staff and consultants who will be presenting um, alongside me this evening, as well as be available to answer your questions. And this is uh, the third in a series of meetings to present the schematic uh, design presentation package for the new facility. And tonight's meeting purpose is to seek direction from City Council on options for aquatics features, sustainability features, and essential services features for the new facility. And once we have that direction, we'll be able to move forward with the next phase, which is the design development phase. And that takes us into a little bit more um, detail uh, design and coming back to you with materials, palette, landscape, palette, and, and more. So the city council action requested is to approve the recommended modifications to the optional items for those three um, topics I just listed, aquatics, sustainability, and essential services. And um, I'm not gonna read all the details just yet. We'll get into more of the details for each of these three topics um, a little bit further into the, the presentation. So the outline for this evening is, um, I'll start with uh, a few slides on the project background, then I'll hand it over to um, some other members of our team to present more of the details on those three different areas I, I had just identified. Um, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take, we're gonna present one at a time and then take council questions after each topic area is presented. Um, then I'll come back, kind of wrap up next steps. And if there's more um, council questions, we're, ha we're happy to take those again. Um, and then we'll move on to um, our usual order of things, the public comments, and then um, concluding with the council deliberation and, and direction. So first, the project background. Um, uh, you know, the, this project started a number of years ago, 2018, with the Year Parks for Future, where we were looking at arts and recreation programming and did a faci facility analysis, not just for Heather Farm, um, but for uh, Civic Park and Shadelands as well. Um, we are now in the phase of the project um, in the new aquatic and community center uh, facility at Heather Farm Park project. And we're in the design and construction phase of that project. Currently with the schematic design presentation package, and as I just mentioned, we'll be coming back with what's known as the de design development phase, which is again, a little bit more further fleshed out uh, design. And that'll take us through April, 2025. And then uh, we'll begin construction of the new facility in summer of 2025. And that'll take um, just over two years to complete. Um, so this slide shows the key project assumptions and principles that were adopted by City Council in September of 2023, um, namely to replace the existing community center and aquatic building with a new facility located at the existing community center site. And it would be replacing three pools with a lap pool and a rec recreational pool, and that our recommendations would be realistic, implementable, and budget conscious. So we presented the first of these three meetings of the schematic design um, presentation package back in February, and uh, the council preferred, uh, of the two schemes that were presented, council preferred scheme A, and um, some of the elements of that was, that was the plan with the more angled floor plan. Um, it provided a little bit more of outdoor space um, at the event garden site, and also had a better um, presence and orientation towards the pond. And this is a, um, an illustration of that scheme preferred by council and the design team are working on adjustments to the roof design based on the council comments from that meeting. We had a second meeting um, on March 5th where we presented the aquatics portion of, of the facility and we will, we've updated our recommendation and we'll be presenting that um, shortly to you this evening. Um, there are three 
outstanding items for which we're seeking city council direction tonight. One is on the aquatics portion, and I, as I just mentioned, we'll be presenting to you um, an updated design. In addition to aquatics, there's two other areas. Sustainability will be presenting with you um, presenting to you a menu of uh, sustainability feature options. And similarly, for essential services, we'll be presenting a menu of, of options with a recommendation for each. And we're seeking um, council direction on each of these. And once we have that direction, we're able to move to the next phase of the project. So um, Kevin Safin is going to um, present the first of those three items, the aquatics. There's someone who looked just like me over there. Uh, thank you, Janine, for the record. Kevin Safin, Director of Arts and Recreation on this side. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here for lots of reasons, not just to present to you, um, but because this is a culmination um, of a project that some of us in this room have been working on for over 15 years. Um, and uh, it's to the credit of many people uh, who are here and who came before us for all the hard work they did. Um, so um, it's a great time to be celebrating the work that we're about to discuss. So aquatics. Um, when we last left off on this topic, a discussion filled with a lot of detail, uh, a lot of comments, a lot of puns, um, but good work and good feedback that we got from the council. And so uh, city team presented to you um, a very detailed schematic uh, package of aquatics pools, pool deck, pool facilities. Uh, you all received a lot of input from the public, uh, heartfelt, uh, and staff and council took that seriously. So the direction that you provided to us was to uh, go back and do a little bit more work with the Walnut Creek Aquatic Foundation, WCAF, uh, on how a revised design could potentially better serve the needs of all of the programs, not just the swim teams, but all the programs um, in the community. Uh, and you were very clear that changes, I'm gonna read this, changes to design need to maintain a balance of programming opportunities and those design changes are not intended to support new revenue, revenue generating events, not intended. It could be that they support that, but that's not our intent. And so staff did that. And so we are proud to present to you what we did and how we did it. And so I'll come back to this slide if you'd like. I'm gonna cover this information a few times this evening. So I'm not gonna go into detail here, but I'm happy to come back to this. Uh, in sum, the changes that we made to the design on March 5th um, are to the 50 meter pool, to the recreational pool, and to the pool building, the bathhouse. Uh, to the recreational pool, there was the most of it, but I'll start at the 50 meter pool. Uh, the biggest change there is that we heard from the community that the design that we had at that time, March 5th, had a hybrid of, wane, of lane widths, some eight feet, some seven feet. The change that you'll see is that all the lane widths are at eight feet, consistent. But in doing so, it means fewer lanes. And so we've gone from 20 lanes to 18 in the 50 meter pool. Again, I'll come back to that. On the recreational pool, we've widened the pool, we've deepened the pool, and we've made it longer. And I'll talk about what that means in a bit. Uh, we changed the location of the changing room to address the needs of what we heard from the teams, as well as what we think is a better design. Uh, and we've taken out the bulkhead from the mix and use the money that we had set aside for the bulkhead to go toward the changes here. And so the net cost of that is about $150,000, which is pretty good considering this is a $77 million project. Um, so um, how did we get there? Uh, just like Janine talked about some of the work that was done in years past, this is going back to 2019, the mission statement around aquatics that was determined by the council at that time. It's a multi-generational community facility. It provides a balance of instruction, recreation, and competition. Uh, it supports family events and social activities for local and for regional activities. Uh, and again, the need for balanced programming drives us in what we do, and I will say that a few times tonight. Principles. So we started with the mission, now we have principles. We established these principles when we started the conceptual and the, the schematic process. So I'm not gonna read all this, but again, balance of recreation and competition. Uh, accommodates the programs that we currently offer at Clark Swim Center and provide, uh, provides an opportunity for future programming, but our focus is on the programs that we do today. That's competition, that's recreation, and that's people who just wanna drop in and have fun. 
uh, maximizing the pool deck space, uh, right-sizing the bathhouse, uh, and providing more spaces to improve our functionality. So those principles were what we focused on when we went back and said, how can we make the March 5th design even better? Uh, our agreement with the Aquatic Foundation was our other principle here. And so this was a pledge back in 2022, uh, an agreement between the city and WCAF to raise money uh, toward the construction of the pool. Primarily their focus was on the 50 meter pool, but the money is gonna go toward the whole facility. So $3 million was their pledge for those two pools, a 50 meter pool and a family recreation pool. Uh, and the city's commitment to the Aquatic Foundation was to allow them to provide input on designs and location of facilities throughout this process. And we've done that. So what's the net result? Um, I'm pleased to be able to share with you what staff believes and the design team believes is a solution to the challenges that we were faced with just a month and a half ago. So those include short course lanes in the 50 meter pool. Those are the 25 yard lanes going across. Um, when we show, and I'll show you an image of this in a little bit. Um, when we showed this to you before, there were 20 short course lanes. Remember that some of those were seven feet, some were eight feet wide. We made them all eight feet wide. But in doing so, we've gone from 20 lanes to 18 lanes. So it's a loss of two lanes on the short course. The pool depths remain the same in this design, and the long course remains the same, which is nine lanes going 50 meters. So again, with that loss of two lanes on the, on the 50 meter pool, staff looked at this and said, what if we added two more lanes to the recreation pool? Uh, so going from the six lanes that we had on March 5th to eight lanes today, same total lanes, right? We had 20 in the, in the 50 meter pool, six in the recreation pool. Now we're showing 18 lanes in the 50 and eight in the 25, uh, at that time 25 yard, now we're looking 25 meters, but essentially the same number of lanes, 26. Uh, we're also suggesting that we deepen a third of that pool beyond what we showed you on March 5th. On the 5th, we talked about a shallow pool from three, six to five feet. Uh, we heard a lot during the meeting on the 5th that the, uh, that the artistic swim team uh, was looking for more deep water. And so what we're showing, what I'll show you in the image is that there's more deep water programming opportunities now than we had on the 5th, which allows the Aquanuts a place to be um, both during their regular practice time and especially during the long course swim time that we heard a lot about whether it's aqua bears or masters. So provides a place for the aquanuts and gives a little bit more room to the masters and the aqua bears during the time that they're in long course. Uh, we've extended the recreation pool. Uh, we heard from the masters that the annual, what they call short course meters meet, a 25 meter meet that they run the diving well, which is 25 meters, was something that was important to them, not just for the community, for their programming, but as fundraising. And so extending that pool from 25 yards to 25 meters uh, addresses that concern. Also takes away the potential need for a bulkhead, which is what the uh, potential was. If the bulkhead was there, you could have a 25 meter course in the 50 meter pool. Uh, we have relocated the changing rooms um, and I'll show you what that looks like from kind of the far west side of the building over to the eastern side, um, which is closer to the pools, better access, better visibility, um, and easier for the teams and, and community to access the pools from that changing room. Um, and that didn't, that didn't add cost to the design, even better. Uh, we're providing support for a future scoreboard. Um, this is not the scoreboard itself, but the infrastructure in the design would allow for conduit wiring, everything that's needed for a scoreboard to be identified and placed, and that could be a fundraising opportunity for the community. The other elements that you saw on March 5th are not changed. So the beach entry, uh, the play structure, and the current channel are still the same as what, what we showed you back a month and a half ago. So again, in terms of cost, um, if you remember the bulkhead, which was in the $77 million budget, was about a $1.08 million option. Uh, we've taken that out, um, and as a result, we're able to allocate those funds toward the recreation pool. Um, and the difference is a little bit more, $150,000, but um, again, we still feel that's worth it for an investment to get this. So those are the design changes that, that we show, um, but so what? Do they meet the expectations of the council and the community? Uh, a question that was raised a lot during March 5th was, does the design meet FINA, which is now World Aquatics Standards? Uh, staff and the Aquatic Foundation met, and we talked about this immediately after the March 5th meeting, and we agreed that a third party review of the work that the Aquatic Design Group had done on this um, would be helpful to determine, do we 
or how does the design meet those standards. So uh, staff contracted with a, a company called Councilman Hunsaker, which is probably the other big uh, aquatic design firm uh, in the country. Um, and they independently reviewed the work that Dennis and his team had done with the overlay of how does this meet the world aquatic standards. Um, and that's in your packet. I'm not gonna go into the detail, but the summary sentence from that group was the, uh, the findings were, the proposed concept, which we showed you, complies with the World Aquatics competition regulations for swimming depth and for artistic swimming field of play. That's a technical way of saying, yes, this complies with World Aquatic Standards, um, which supports the work that Aquatic Design Group had done um, and staff, and I think the Aquatic Foundation uh, feel good about that. Uh, and then there's a question about scheduling and programming. Um, we heard this from council, this was direction from you to say, does a new design better meet the needs of the community this is across the board in terms of programming. So um, we believe that this concept allows for more competition use. When I say competition, I mean com competitive team use of the recreation pool, the synchronized, the artistic swim team. Uh, could also be used by the masters, right, for their swim meet, um, and maybe even the aqua bears for some of their practices. This balances the programming um, across what I'm saying is three pools, right? You have two pools at Clark and then one pool at Larky, um, allowing a balanced mix of programming for the three competition teams, the community uses, um, and things like camps and our programming that the city does. So uh, staff shared this concept um, with the Aquatic Foundation. Uh, staff met with the coaches from all three teams. Um, and we received support from the foundation and the teams for this conceptual schedule. And so what does that mean for the foundation? Uh, I'm gonna brag a little bit that the partnership that we have with this group is really strong. Uh, Mike Keeney, the president of the foundation is here tonight. Um, and I appreciate their support and partnership and relationship that we've had over the past 15 plus years on this project. Um, going back longer for the teams and the work they've done here at Clark, 30, 40, 50 years. And so we received, uh, and the city was grateful for this letter of support from the foundation, which is in your packet, um, showing support for the design which is presented to you tonight. Uh, as well as a commitment to continue to work together on meeting the terms of the MOU and receiving and soliciting their input on the design as we move forward. So uh, partnership with the Aquatic Foundation continues to be strong um, and we're very pleased with their support. Uh, so images, what does this look like now? This is where we were on March 5th and I can toggle back and forth between these if you'd like. Um, so uh, again, this was a 20 lane 50 meter pool, which is the rectangle on the right, um, from the depths of three, six to 13 feet. A varying width of the, the lanes from eight feet to seven feet. As you go south to north, it went from eight feet to seven feet as you have that lighter pink area. Uh, and then the recreation pool was six lanes uh, and the depth was three and a half to five feet. So as I go to what we have now, um, the 50 meter pool, the dimensions don't change. It's still 50 meters by 25 yards, um, but the change is that we have wider, consistent eight-foot lanes throughout the pool. But again, we go from 20 lanes to 18. So that's what I've circled there. It's hard to read, but um, there are 18 lanes going left to right there. That's 25 yards, short course. We still have the same long course. That's north to south, uh, nine lanes there. Uh, thank you, Elena. Um, on the recreation pool, which is the smaller rectangle on the left, um, it's gone from, again, six lanes at 25 yards to now eight lanes at 25 meters. Uh, and then the other change is in that little bit darker blue there, that's where the deeper water is. So now goes from three and a half transitions to, oh, Dennis, four and a half, to eight feet at the deepest end there. And so again, about a third of that pool is is that eight feet? Yeah, the third of that pool is eight feet deep. So we've had a lot of discussions with the Aquanuts about will that meet your needs? Um, nobody's needs will be met completely in any of these designs, um, including the cities, but it will meet a lot of their needs. And this is very similar to what we have at Larky. Um, Larky has about 10 or 11 lanes. This shows eight, but the synchronized swim team is the primary user of Larky. And this essentially adds more deep water to their needs. And so we're pleased with that. And then up on top is the change in the, in the changing room. Um, so it goes from, it was on the left there, um, which is again, a little bit farther. And the entrance, Elena, is, is up on the right a little bit. Um, if you keep going right, 
yeah, that's where the entrance is. And so we had the changing room way on the other side, um, closer as you're heading to the park. And so this new design, which was suggested by the Aquatic Foundation, moves it as you just enter the building. Um, it's immediately there, um, the changing room. And so there have been some other changes to the bathhouse as well, but we're primarily focused on the changing room. So again, happy to come back to this if you'd like. This shows the overall site plan. Um, the point I want to make here is with all the changes that, that I just described, there is no additional encroachment into the park. So it's still the same footprint that we had on March 5th, which, which was something that was important to the council and to the community. And so um, Janine already showed this, but I like it because this is a very nice picture of what this facility is at least at this point, schematically going to look like. Um, the pool you see, you know, the 50 meter pool is farthest going, <laughs> going toward Mount Diablo is a 50 meter pool. The recreational pool is the one a little bit closer. Um, and then the community center is, is uh, in front near the pond. And so um, this just kind of shows you how it all relates to, um, to each other. And so um, in closing, at least for my part, um, summary, uh, this meets, this design staff feels this meets the balanced mission that the council uh, approved back in 2019, as well as the design principles that, that were established as we embarked on this project, uh, satisfies the world aquatic standards. It adds potential scheduling and programming opportunities. Doesn't add significantly to the budget. And it's supported by staff, the design team, and the foundation. Uh, and before I close with giving kudos to council, I also want to acknowledge my staff, um, specifically Karen Houston Martin, who's here in the audience, um, whose relationship with the teams and her dedication to putting together not one but two many page conceptual schedules um, I think really made the difference here in helping the teams and the foundation understand that this is a facility that can work for all of us. So thank you, Karen, for all your work. Uh, and so um, with the city council's support, um, as you've shown throughout this process, um, this project will continue to move forward. So we're excited about that. So with that, happy to answer your questions. Oh. Um, I was so fascinated, I <laughs> forgot I had to run the meeting. Um, is there any uh, further questions from council? Kevin, please. Um, thank you very much. I'm sure we have a lot to talk about during the debate portion. Um, great to see uh, some of the compromises here that were worked out, but I'm curious, were any of the aquatics groups, I'm talking about all the groups that we were putting this all together for, compromised negatively by the change? I mean, it looks like great positives. Was there a consequence that is going to negatively impact one of the teams? Uh, staff doesn't believe so. Um, I would expect that um, if the Aquatic Foundation president has thoughts about that, he would share them. But when we met with the teams a couple of weeks ago, we didn't hear that from any of the three major swim teams. That's good. So thank you for the question. Yes. That's good. Uh, we heard a lot about competitive, competitive tournaments. Uh, how are those impacted by this? So tournaments meaning broadly swim meets and broadly other activities. Swim, yes. um, we believe, and I'll, I can show you, um, through this concept, uh, while the city doesn't host meets, we don't host meets, right? It's the swim teams that host the meets, but we believe with this design, we can do more than we showed on March 5th. So for example, the masters, uh, meters meet can be hosted here now by the masters team. Um, we can, we believe, continue to host the all city meet the conference meet, um, but it's not our intent to have a whole lot of major swim meets because again, one with the proximity to the community center, um, the more big meets we have here, the less we can do in that building. Um, it also affects the, the rest of the park. And so um, events that probably take up most of the facility, we're looking at maybe four big, big, big events a year, like all city, like conference meet. And so that's when we kind of close down other activities in the park, rentals and other activities on, this, on the soccer field. Um, but when I say four, we could still do, in addition to those four, we could still do the master's short course meters meet, right? Because that does not close the whole facility. We could still do a synchronized swim show that does not close the whole facility. So we can do more through this design, but the intent is not to do a whole lot more. Great. Thank you, those are my questions. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Um, to me, this feels like good news. Me too. One of the issues that had come up over the course of time was that the original design at Clark, all three pools were connected on the same system, which meant that we get one temperature and everybody had to live with it. Mm -hmm. Does this um, accommodate multiple temperature pools? Is it 
and can you explain that, or should I hold my question and ask yeah. this of the pool designer? Well, I, I will answer your yes or no question, say yes, and then I will have Dennis Berkshire address the how of that. Um, and uh, even today, we can have different temperatures in the pools just because the pool depths are different, but you can't set it that way. It just kind of happens naturally, but I'll have Dennis talk about <laughs> it's that. It's an organic how, process. How exactly. <laughs> well, the deeper pools, right, hold their temperatures better than the shallow pools. Um, but Dennis will talk about the, the design going forward. <coughs> Good evening. It's nice to see you all here again. Um, yes, first of all, we have two separate systems. So okay. both of the, the rec pool and the competition pool operate independently. We can have temperatures set up with whatever it is we're wanting to, to use to those. Within the pool itself, say the rec pool, for example, um, we have the ability to vary. And based on the way we're looking at the sizing and the turnover of water, we can vary the temperature slightly. In other words, we can set it up so that we've got more water going to the shallow coming out of the heaters so that you can try to get that slightly warmer than the other parts of the pool. But beyond that, you're going to be limited to that co-mingling of the water within the pool itself. So the eight-foot deep water in the recreation pool uh -huh. is likely to be cooler than the splash water in the near the slide and play area. It, it is. Okay. For two reasons, massive water, that depth that you've got. We look at the pounds of water that we've got there and the, the battery that it becomes. And the second is that in the, the shallow water, we're going to have water turning over through that area about once every hour to or so, whereas in that deep water, it's turning over once every six hours. So we're not taking the heated water to that deep water as frequently, which will allow us to, to get that as well. Organic, natural. Yes. <laughs> Okay, I have some other questions, but you know, it, they may involve you. <laughs> the, the elimination for the need for the bulkhead also just to ensure I understood, because we never saw it in the design previously, we needed to add two, two meters to the 50 meter pool previously to accommodate the storage capacity for that bulkhead. So the cost savings was not only in the bulkhead itself, but also in the extra length of the 50 meter pool? Correct, that's right. The, um, will the recreation pool, the eight foot deep end be deep enough? I think the answer is yes, for starting blocks for the um, 25 meter mm -hmm. masters program. Yes, it does. It exceeds the state requirement of six feet, six inches. It exceeds the World Aquatics or right. FINA standard. In fact, the, the World Aquatics FINA standard is four and a half feet, which our state health doesn't even allow. So okay. while it exceeds that, and so high school, master swim, all of those, it exceeds the, the requirements for safe diving. So that, okay. And previously, it wouldn't have been able to do that. At so it'll be set it up not. for starting blocks, but portable. Correct. So they can yeah, they're removable, and they can be stored away. Removable. Thank you. Portable. Yes. Well, they're portable, too, because yes. if you remove them, you aren't just going to leave them standing, sitting on the deck. The, um, the last uh, meeting that we discussed this, there's a grade change between the area with the 50-meter pool and the area with the recreational pools. What have you done here to accommodate the location of um, bleachers and the taking advantage of the grade change? Oh, I bet I got somebody else. Yay. I'm going to think, see if I can think of a question for each of you. You want to hold up a flashcard to tell me what to ask? Good evening. Thank you. Um, so we, oh, I'm Gina Chavez, landscape architect from RRM Design Group. So we do have space in that center area for remo for removable and portable bleachers. So lots of space, yeah, that whole center area. There are, we removed one staircase, which was in the center, which allowed for more blank, flexible space. Oh, thank you, yes. Correct, so now we have staircases at either end as well as an accessible ramp on the north end. And I noticed in the um, in the staff report that we lost a bit of um, square footage of paved service. Is it in the recreation area 
Where is it in the 50 meter pool area? It's in the recreation area. All right. So basically, the recreation pool slid west. That's to right. To accommodate the additional length of the recreational pool as well as not to lose um, more deck space around the 50 meter pool. That's correct. Yes. Because of the All Abilities Playground, we have no more room to move south. Right. Right. <laughs> Thank you. I think that that has been very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wait. I did have another question. Who's responsible for the changing rooms? <laughs> all right. See? <laughs> I'm working my way through you all. I don't know you exactly, so I don't know what to ask you. <laughs> uh, don't worry. You'll be able to. Um, we received a public comment that it's still not right. There's still not adequate changing rooms, et cetera. Do you, did you see that public comment? I and did. Do you yes. have, would you like to clarify what's being misconstrued by the member of the public? Sure. Jocelyn Lawrence Barish, I'm with Nolan Tam Architects. And um, the question that we received was talking about how there did not appear to be sinks, either the adequate number, or maybe they weren't able to see what we were representing to be sinks in the changing rooms. So the changing rooms include showers that have changing room compartments attach them so there's a little more privacy than what you would have at Clark today and restrooms and sinks and the amount that are in that block that you see to the north aren't the only ones that will be available to the pool deck but they are able to accommodate the traffic that mostly will be usually coming through the pool facility so there definitely are sinks in the design Fear not. Uh, we, there is a there is actually a code requirement for a specific number of fixtures, and we are going to meet that. And I remember that there is a code requirement, and it's really based on the amount of flat water. Exactly. Like, right. So this actually addresses to the requirement that a certain amount of flat water has to per toilet. <laughs> yeah. It's, well, it's essentially that there's a, a certain amount of flat water uh, determines an occupant load factor. There's like a 15 square feet per person. That's right, Dennis. Ah, good. And that tells you how many people they could expect at maximum capacity. It, and even though that's actually really tight, what it, you were not really going to have a one person every 15 square feet in, the, in those pools. But it accounts for spectators and various people on the deck that might need facilities okay. as, well, as well. So those, that maximum number of people is then um, compared to a table that tells you how many fixtures are required for restrooms, for showers, um, for sinks, for even drinking fountains. Um, and those will all be accommodated in the design. So the important thing is that you have to show that we have adequate number of toilets. That's the driving factor, and the sinks will be in the more detailed design That's in right. the subsequent. All right, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. I'm waiting to see if you could figure out one more question and ask for the guy that managed to get away with it. But I'd have to guess, like, you know, what kind of plants are you going to use around the... But I, I, he could, might not be the landscape architect, so... Okay, uh, Matt, would you go next, please? Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure who among you, but one of you can answer it, I'm sure. Uh, in terms of deck space and landscaped area, which I know is really important, mm -hmm. compared to the what we have now at Clark and the prior design, well, really, sure. mostly what we have now at Clark. Yeah. Did you know, Jane, do we have a backup slide on this? All right. Um, I'm going to ask one of my staff, Karen, can you look at this? Do you have a print out of it? Or Mike, do you have a print of it that you can see what this looks like in, in real time? Like, anyway, so Jane is going to come up. Um, so uh, the headline is there's more. There's more landscape area than we have in Clark today, and there's more deck space than we have in Clark today. Um, unfortunately, my slide is a little bit too tiny to see unless you can have really good eyes, but um, you might have to go from memory. <laughs> well, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it is more. Um, yeah, in previous presentations, we had a blow up of that table. Can you zoom in? <laughs> yeah. Mm. Oh, yes. On page nine in this. It's on page nine in the staff report, bottom. Okay. <laughs> My eyes still aren't great. Can you read it? 35,961 currently. Yeah, 36 to 40. So 
So it's about 36 today. Square, 36,000 square feet today um, is the pool deck, and you're going to about 40,000. The number we showed you in March was about 42,000, roughly. So it's gone down a little bit, Councilmember Francois, from where we were um, in March because of the expan expansion of the recreation pool. That's the pool deck. Um, the, the landscaped area is going from about the same, about 36. It's about 50-50 at Clark today to about 39,000 square feet. So it's more square feet in both. And was the bulkhead factored into the March deck space? Because that was taking up space. So. It on was. The... It was not okay. because we hadn't pursued that option yet. So if we had, then it would have been eh, maybe, maybe similar to what you see today in this okay. design. Okay. Uh, I think that's all I had for now. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I just have a simple question, and it's going on the rec pool from 25 yards to 25 meters. Um, is that gonna? Is that going to be used as part of regular um, training ground? And does that difference between the yards and the meters affect the kids as far as I remember um, the obsession with learning your number when you cross the T and how to your flip? Um, right. So uh, this is similar to what we have today in the, in the diving well. That's uh -huh. 25 meters. Um, and then the 50. The 50 meter pool has 25 yards in the short course. So, already have that mix of different lengths in both pools. But Karen can talk a little bit more about how we anticipate programming it. And I don't expect there's a whole lot of difference between programming 25 meter and 25 yard pool, but you can. Um, how we, hi, sorry, Karen Houston Martin, program um, manager. Um, the way that we envision programming that pool, uh, if we need to move. It would be used primarily during long course, mm -hmm. when the 50 meter pool is long course. We would be able to divide the 50 meter pool up and have synchro in, in the 50 meter pool um, while putting some of the older kids or at the discretion of the Aqua Bear coaches, which, which of their um, teams would use that 50 meter pool. Currently, the Aqua Bears use the diving well in the morning and swim 25 meters all year round. Okay. No? So it's already happening. It's so already if happening. it's wrong, yeah. it's already happening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. And then, um, oh, there was one more question. But I, oh, I know. The, the lane widths in the rec pool are seven foot or eight foot? They're currently seven feet, uh -huh. which is consistent with the diving well right now. Okay. So it's basically replicating what we have in the diving well Correct. at this point. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I've never competitively swum, and I don't know what I'm asking, except um, it seems to me like if we're having um, meets, uh, do, do, do the, are the pools compatible so like the recreational long part can, can be warm-up stuff for somebody who's going to be in the... Yes, if we held a 25-yard meet, um, typically would, we would take the 10 lanes that are the deepest mm -hmm. and up to 13, 14, wherever that cutoff is, and use those for competitive, have two lanes, at least two lanes of like a buffer, and then the remainder of the lanes could be used as warm-up, warm-down. We could also use the 25-meter for warm-up and warm-down as well. Okay. And we've done that in the past. Okay. I hope everybody knows that I know you need to warm up. Okay, is there any other, yes. Uh, let me, one more quick one. Um, in the new pool, I know when we would run the Clark pool for a meet, you couldn't do dives in the practice area. Is this pool gonna be deep enough that you could do dives in the practice area? To do I'm, like racing start dives? Yeah, racing starts. What, by practice area, you mean the recreational pool? I mean, um, I mean the shallow end, when you have um, a meet and you have the, so it would not be, but when we run meets, we don't want those swimmers diving into the okay. into the practice lanes because it's a little unorganized. They jump on top of each other. I've right. been in charge of that, and it's not fun. It's like, ah! Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. I don't see any need for the council to ask additional questions. Is there any other additional information you'd like to share with us? Uh, I'm going to hand this over to Jocelyn Lawrence Bayer to talk about sustainability, and then she's also going to talk about essential services, uh, and then we'll be happy to answer any questions. So I'll go questions about each of those topics after she's done with each one, and then we'll come back to you again if you have any more about aquatics. But Jocelyn, thank you. 
Good evening. So we also have some sustainability options in addition to aquatics to talk to you tonight about. And um, I wanted to start by saying, I'll really focus on option two and saying what is already part of the current design. Option two most clearly defines that. So we did already have in our design a uh, building that you could call sustainable. It is not simply a code compliant building. You should know that the California code does require that buildings be fairly sustainable at this point, but we've gone beyond that in a three key respects. The first is there is no technical requirement for a photovoltaic array of solar panels currently required by code for this kind of facility. And instead of just bowing to that, we've said, no, it would be a great idea to have, we targeted a 25 to 50% energy offset for the building. It results in a 135 kilowatt PV array, which can easily be accommodated on the well-aspected roofs of the current design. In addition to that, we've made the commitment that the building will be an all-electric facility. Similarly, the, even though the code is trending towards that requirement, it is not currently a requirement that the building be all electric. So we're exceeding code by saying that the building facility itself will only run on electric energy, which allows it to be compensated by renewable energy sources. And lastly, we're aiming for a lead silver equivalency. So just a little brief um, primer about, about what that means. Um, so lead is a standard set by the US Green Building Council many, many years ago, and uh, for those of you who are less familiar with it, it's a, a series, a, a very long series of checklists, and it's a certain combination of all of the points that you earn on that checklist that de determines which level you can reach. And so uh, it, we, have, we, we have not yet completed the checklist to figure out which exactly ones we would need to get to lead silver. Um, having the PV array, having an all-electric facility gets you well towards that lead equivalency, but there'd be an, an additional number of strategies, probably largely focused on water use reduction that could get us to those lead silver points that would be required. And by equivalency, we mean we probably would refrain from actually registering the product with the project with um, the USGBC and instead focus the somewhat sizable fees that it's required to do that uh, on actually the design itself. So that's all incur included within the current project costs that we've been holding. <clears throat> we've given you a number of other options to consider, however. The first is a more conservative, less sustainable option over in the left-hand most column, where instead of assuming an all-electric facility, it would be a, a, a hybrid electric and gas-powered facility. And um, there would be a, a, very, a very much smaller array of PVs. It's still... <laughs> not the zero that's required by code, but closer to what code would require should code be applied to this kind of building. The code requirements for a photovoltaic arrays is actually fairly small currently. So if it would be closer to this 50 kilowatt PV array you see in column one. Um, and, and instead of looking for those extra water reductions, et cetera, to, lead, to, to address a lead silver level of equivalency, we would simply be sticking with the code guideline, guidelines for how the building would be sustainable. And you would have a resultant savings of about 500K for the project. In addition, there's two more columns. The third one is the staff recommended option. So as, as the, the group of designers and city staff who have been considering all of the multitudinous sustainable strategies that could be implemented for a project like this, I was really decided that um, providing the infrastructure, so specifically providing the structural support required and the electrical support that would be required to have more photovoltaic array in the future, more um, possibility for adding a, some battery backup for the building um, would be a very worthy investment at this point in the project. Retrofitting structure to support more PVs over time is very difficult and costly. And at this point, building it from scratch in that way is a, is a much more cost effective way to build. Um, and the batteries, I'll, I can spend more time talking about them as you so choose, but um, we did a, a pretty deep dive into research. That's actually what my, our, our additional row member here is for. Here's our director of sustainability and project architect for the project can, can talk about research we did into how batteries could or may not play a role in the project. Essentially what it came down to was um, 
the current battery technology would require that if we house them within the facility itself, there be a very significant fire separation that makes it difficult to house them within the building itself. It would actually be more cost effective to house them separately in a separate structure, perhaps in the parking lot, which makes the folks who are concerned about parking access and parking count a little nervous. Um, and in addition, the ways that the battery can act in concert with some of the other services that will, and options that we'll talk about that the building might provide are not quite as flexible as they are poised to be in the near future. And so it, it seemed as we were a group deciding on what to recommend or not that battery technology is about to get a lot better. And giving yourself the opportunity to expand into more battery capacity that could be contained within the building itself for with more flexibility in how those batteries function is probably the best way to spend your money at the moment. Moment. However, should the council choose, there are some other sustainable options we've provided costs for. One of those is a 10% battery backup for the facility. So you can see the actual cost of what that would require. Um, you could also add additional photovoltaic panels if you wanted to come close to actually equaling out the energy consumption of the building itself. You'd need to add another 165 kilowatts of, of PVs, and that would mean um, more than could be accommodated simply on the roofs themselves. You'd need to then have some of the trellises and other structures within the site able to support PVs. You would therefore not need to have the, the future support um, functions. You, you would have maxed out your, your PV um, capability at that point. There are other things that we could look at and would need to look at if we, for instance, wanted to reach the next level of LEED equivalency or certification. We've actually put the price here for actual certification um, for a LEED gold level. And some of the things that were brought up that could be, for instance, in alignment with the city's sustainable ac sustainability action plan could be things like instituting natural ventilation throughout the building, um, having a portion of the building include a green roof. Um, they do come with a, a price tag and so we've summarized some of those prices in, the, in that far right column. So obviously to the leftmost column, that's the more conservative, more fiscally responsible set of options, and to the left, the more sustainable, um, but therefore slightly more first cost, um, uh, con um, has more first cost in, in that right hand most column. And so both myself and also um, Edward Reifenstein, our Director of Sustainability, are happy to take your questions uh, about any portions of this. And there's, there's certainly a lot of background information we both put in the staff report and that went into the creation of these categories. So please feel free. I'm going to get the qu first question, which is, um, do, we, do, do we take into consideration, this is just the building cost? Um, does, I'm assuming the more you get in the power department and the battery department and that sort of thing, your day-to-day -day operating costs are saved. And, and so, you know, it would take a long time to make up 2.3 million, but um, is, it, is it worth considering that the operating costs would go down? It is a, it is a consideration. It's not one that um, formed the basis of this matrix. But it is worth con it is worth paying attention to as you move further to the right. It is by definition when a system is more sustainable, you will over the long term have a, a greater return on investment. However, there is there is a, a specific project budget that we are trying to meet, and so that did inform that balance of fiscal responsibility and making sure we ha kept the commitment to have this be a sustainable building. Hopefully, that answers answers your question. Anybody else, uh, Matt? Please. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the information. I what were the assumptions in option two about battery storage? There is none. Okay. And is that, it's only when you get to option four? That's right. Okay. And so it's just essentially, there, it's, we have solar on the building to offset about 25 to 50% of our energy usage of the building. That's right. And nothing for the pool, and maybe that's a pool guy question. Is that just something that you wouldn't do for a commercial facility like this? It's only done for a residential? I can, I can partially answer that question, and, and Ned can help me if needed. But we did actually look at the possibility of having electric pools and finding a way to offset them. And the cost of that did not fit within the project budget as it currently stands. Because of the number of arrays that you would need to heat that amount of water. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's a, a scale factor different than what you're looking at here because heating pool water is energy intensive. 
Okay. Uh, thank you. Those were my questions. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, and thanks for diving into this. Um, I, sorry. Um, I'm kind of looking, when I started looking at this, I really started looking at it as the Wella was talking about, as, as we're investing in the sustainability features that reduce the operating costs, there's a payback period. And the things that affect that payback period are how much does it cost, how much are you saving, and then how much, what our opportunities are there to reduce your capital expenditures. And so I know, I, I know the answer to this because I asked the staff. The, the Federal Inflation Reduction Act included a prov provision that is going through rulemaking right now that allows cities who do not pay taxes and who have been unable to benefit from the 30 percent, we will be able to benefit from them when the rulemaking's done. Did we factor in the Inflation Reduction Act in the cost of the arrays and the storage? At the moment, we can't, only in that um, the price that we need to pr keep in the project budget is the one that you have to pay the contractor. Mm -hmm. And so those are the prices reflected here. Any of those incentives that you would get would be received after you would have already paid that money to the contractor. Mm -hmm. So you would, as you've discussed, you know, be able to potentially be um, eligible for those programs and then see a savings. But just to, to make sure you have the money to cover all your costs, we have to tell you what it is without those mm -hmm. at, at, at first. Okay. And then there's also um, a number of different programs looking at, you know, kind of the dual challenges of sustainability with emergency response. And I know I could give you some of the names, but there are a couple that are focused specifically on energy supply reliability and storage for um, buildings that are used as emergency response centers. Um, and they have weird criteria, like you have to have had two power safety shutoffs, and you have to do this, and you have to do that. Have we done any evaluating of the grants that are available right now? I know the CPUC has like $2 billion right now for the sustainable. We, we looked less at the grants because we had our mechanical engineering plumbing subconsultant give us a, a deep education in how batteries could play a role in your essential mm -hmm. services functions. And what they told us is that the bottom line is it wouldn't be their recommendation to use batteries. Even though code is beginning to allow batteries to provide energy for essential services, specifically because batteries soon will be, but are not as flexible as a gas-powered generator. Mm -hmm. And when you're trying to provide emergency energy, the flexibility of that, and, and specifically that uh, a gas generator can keep running all day with gas being poured into it, but batteries have a, a ca specific capacity and must be recharged. And so it's it's likely very soon coming that there will be the, the same kind of network of batteries, that there are a network of portable generators to supply that in the future. But since we're not quite there, that's why we're saying give yourself the opportunity to ha have battery energy take over in the future. But at the moment, since you're not quite there, don't commit to a system that could very soon get a lot better. Okay. And then um, when we started the project, I know lead times with PG&E are long, but I understand we didn't apply for net metering two. We're at net metering three. And I know net metering three really um, doesn't pay off as well unless you have solar storage combined. That's right. Um, but maybe uh, there, I'm, I'm holding out hopes for a, a NEMA four that could be better than NEMA three that you could be eligible for. <laughs> Who knows? Um, as, a, as a personal, I am, I'm personally signed up into NEMA two. I understand exactly what you're talking yeah. about. Um, and so it's true that a, a battery storage is kind of the only way that you will, y you will get any benefit from in your relationship with PG&E with PVs. Mm -hmm. um, and so that still being said, this, is, this was our way of meeting the project budget. Mm -hmm. So if you were to go through and do option three, which gives you the flexibility to um, add components over time, one of the other things with the Inflation Reduction Act is there are all these requirements on those things about um, project labor and um, not using bond dollars and all of those things. If you were to pull those together and make them a separate component that you, inst you didn't do instantaneously with this project, 
but looked at it as we are investing in reducing our operating cost over time mm -hmm. with when we get past that magic threshold where the batteries work better. Um, you could come back then, like, depending on how well you believe the miracle in batteries, in a year or two, and, and say, okay, now we have, we're going to do just that part of this. You could do that with this. Absolutely, especially since what we're looking at now is not something that's integrated into the facility, mm -hmm. um, but would have been separate anyway. So it, it's very easily a separate project. So, the, so regardless, as long as we're using lithium for batteries, they're going to be exactly separate it. from the structure. They're going to be in the parking lot. They might not look attractive, but they're going to be in the parking lot. Um, so we can go in and add that at a future point and uh, be fine. And that's what option three's package would make easy by mm -hmm. having those connections ready to be switch, you know, throw the switch and it's all connected. Okay. And then the um, when you get to the full 300 um, kilowatt, at that point you're actually putting them on the trellises, not just on the roof? That's right. Okay. There's not enough roof space for the full 300 array. How much roof, how much, and I know they're getting more effective over time. Got but I got them up, yeah. <laughs> how, what can you put on that roof? Uh, yes, I'm Ned Reifenstein, also an architect with Nolan Tam. Um, so you can get about 200 kilowatts mm -hmm. on the roof. Um, that is in the really optimal orientation, the south facing orientation. We could put more. Um, it wouldn't be, it, it might not be as cost effective in terms of the yields you'd get and the, the optimal would probably be on the trellises instead. Um, that's a study we would do in mm -hmm. the next phase. Um, if we were to, to go for a 300 kilowatt target, we would figure out where to put them. But our sense right now is that only about 200 of that would fit on the roof. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Thank you. I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Because <laughs> the, the, the last part, it's, it seems you're saying that you're pretty sure that the batteries are not worth it right now. But I know, um, I also sit on the MCE board and we are actively looking for commercial and industrial locations that can combine solar with batteries. What our engineers said to us was, Right now, projects that opt for that are bearing the forerunner cost of that, and so it's it's a higher it's a higher first cost than you would eventually bear. So mm -hmm. if we had a, a much more flexible project budget, we would it would be easier to recommend it. But because we have a number of costs, you know, the changes in the aquatics options, and you still do still have one more yeah, <laughs> section so we need to look at there. that have costs associated with them. That um, it, it, we needed to balance that with the fiscal responsibility overall. Mm -hmm. um, so. That's still wanted to put the price up there so you could see if this is something, you, a direction you want to go in. It's, it's and and I know there's also private companies like Engie that are out there actively looking to bear that tip of the spear cost. Um, have you on, it doesn't sound like you've taken that there on this project. Have you worked on any other of the projects? I know that they are approaching some of the cities around the Bay Area about. Um, it, they have been approaching a couple of the cities about putting solar and storage together on um, from a from an entrepreneurial perspective. Public private um, partnership. No. You haven't? Okay. All right. Thanks. Looking for other questions. I, I feel like after that, anything I ask is gonna be simple math. <laughs> after hearing that calculus course. So I'm going to let Cindy's questions feel like we've gotten further. <laughs> we changed out the batteries in our cabin, and the technology from 2009 to, two, to this year is gobsmacking. Yeah. But... Just yeah. telling you, I think, though, it'll be... I know. It, it, we're we're, we're getting gobsmacked, like, in a in a, in a lot. Absolutely, yeah. 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 Okay, I don't, I don't hear any forward motion from the council here. So uh, do we have one more section to, to discuss? So let's move Hopefully on. not requiring calculus. Uh, yeah. 
Okay, so uh, there was also a directive uh, at the beginning of this project during conceptual design. It was set that this this facility should act in some manner as an essential services facility for the city. And so we did a lot of exploration into how exactly that could get defined, what exactly that would include, and there are three different options in front of you for how that could be accommodated. So um, specifically what we've been targeting is something called an EOC or an emergency operations center. In order to qualify for that, the structure has to be designed to what we call structural risk category four. And what that means in layman's terms is that the building is immediately occupiable after a seismic event like a hospital. It makes it seem like anything less than structure four might be unsafe, but it's really not true. Most of our buildings are not designed to that level and they're very, very safe. But this one is extra safe. Essentially, it's a very similar structural design, but everything is upsized by a certain factor to make sure that it really won't go anywhere. So that uh, emergency personnel within the city can use this as a center for communication. So in order to do that, you don't actually have to have the whole facility be, to be designed to that structural level. Obviously, having larger structural members bears a certain amount of cost. Relative to the overall cost of the project, it's not that large. But there is a, there, we've broken this down so that in the, within the first category, we would design at least 50% of the facility to this higher structural risk category level, probably the community center portion since it has uh, air, rooms and areas that are easier for staff to assemble in. Uh, we would also assume that there would be a spot for hookup of a portable generator. We did consider whether or not there should be a permanent generator on site, and it, the, the city staff have a lot of familiarity with using portable generators, generators and assure us that that is um, the most cost-effective way to provide an easy source of consistent energy for this particular function. Um, and then the, the HVAC system that we're specifying also has the ability to add smoke filtration so that um, in the event that it's not actually an earthquake that causes everyone to rush this building to need to do uh, emergency communications, there could be protection from wildfire smoke, for instance. So the first, the first option is the, is the most conservative, again, of the three. The middle column would be simply adding that higher risk category level to the entire building. What that would gain you is um, potentially a longer period of operation. The rest of the building has more restrooms. Um, and so potentially you would have, you could have a larger number of staff that could be accommodated who might need to be taking, um, taking action with the emergency communication. But n none of them are, are truly an EOC, excuse me, for column one, neither column one or two are an actual EOC. They're called EOC ready, as in, they're almost ready to be to act as, as this communication center, but it's the, the portion that's missing is listed in column three, which is the communication systems themselves. There's inf additional infrastructure within the communication system and the actual equipment itself that doesn't have a use during the regular normal operation of the facility that could be housed on site that would make it from EOC ready into an actual EOC, that literally all that would have to happen would be staff roll up and begin to use the center to provide immu emergency communications for the city itself. Um, each of these does have a slight more cost. All of them are currently uh, well within the cost that was set aside and allocated for this, for this particular um, function for the building during the conceptual cost estimate. And it's literally just a question of, you know, a slightly more conservative, do we need all that space to, to withstand an earthquake? And do we wanna have the communications functions already on site or could we use other ones that the city may have? Um, so any questions you have about this, we're also happy to take. We looked into a lot of other options than these, but these seem like the best way to fulfill this function for the city. I'm looking for lights. Uh, Cindy Silva. Okay, now you're in my wheelhouse a little bit, not as much as hers, but. <laughs> Um, so let's talk about EOC operational, what it means from a true communication standpoint. Does this mean we need more towers or antennas on the site? Do we need to store consoles there? Do we need to store radios there? Not likely one or two, but yes, likely three and four, and the design has not been completed, so I don't have a 100% answer to any of those, but that's okay. the initial. So we're going to assume that the, um, the network itself is going to Yes, we're supported. assuming the network itself is actually still working. The same is actually true of the plumbing system. Okay. 
And it is, I'm just saying, you know, I'm on the <laughs> California Seismic Safety Commission and yes. seen pictures of yes, where that doesn't four that versus doesn't happen. Versus two and it's hospitals, which fire might, stations, and police departments for fours. And why wouldn't we want to make this a four? Which, which might sway your decision from column one to column two because there's a pool that you could get to if the whole building is seismically sound. Just, just. Okay. Thank you. I was a little confused in about this, the discussion of the budget. It says all options are in the EOC budget allocation, but it, it, they don't obviously all cost the same. One no. costs more than no, another. They, no, and, and they, incre they incrementally increase by about 200K okay. roughly each. But what we mean by that is that um, when if you looked in the staff report at the approved project budget from February of 2023, there was a line item held for the EOC function. It was 1.77 million. So compared to um, compared to what is already in the project budget, these are just in incremental increases, and they don't take all of that budget. Okay. So they're all well within. We can have. You could have any th of the three of these. Just realize, though, we have said <laughs> elsewhere that th the the project is not does not does not have infinitely expandable budget. So, any of any of the gains you make towards the more fiscally conservative columns are easily uh, absorbed um, yes. absorbed into what we're what we're trajectorying over overall. And, and we will talk about that when Jocelyn's finished. We'll talk some of these other cost considerations. So yeah. this isn't a, oh, we can save money here. Let's go spend it elsewhere. Yeah. So no, I, yeah. I was saying I wasn't the same gonna, thing. I wasn't going to go buy the battery. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, <laughs> just, to, just to be clear. Okay. And then my other question is, I, I had not even thought of this until we started talking about this as an EOC. And then I was thinking of the last time our EOC was activated was not fire, not earthquake, but flood. We're not in the flood zone here, are we? Uh, Heather Farm is not in the flood zone. Okay, good. I just thought I should ask that question. California Department of Park or Water Resources one time was planning their EOC on the banks of the American River until it was pointed out that it was in the flood zone. And that was a bad idea. So <laughs> we've moving on. Our knowledge has advanced. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us. <yeah. laughs> so let me just clarify my understanding. Yes. Basically, this unlike the sustainability where you can get things ready for the future, this basically says if you're going to build it to ca category four, category? Yep. Yes. Category four, you need to build it. Yes. Because otherwise, you, otherwise you're going back and trying to shore up. Very expensive, difficult. All right. Yeah, you want to do it now. And Matt. you want you want to mm -hmm. do the, the equipment now too? The infrastructural part at the very least, you know, the, the portable portions of it, that's, that's that's easier to have later, but the communications okay. infrastructure should support those pieces of communication equipment that you want to do now as well, if you, you can. Councilman, for, Councilman Friend, Swa. Thank you. Um, we don't have an EOC facility now, is that, is that right? I'm going to have Rich Payne talk about what our current EOC capability is, if that's okay, Rich. It's not as if we're not prepared to handle, and we have handled emergencies, but not to this standpoint. We're just talk about that. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Council Members, Rich Payne. Um, I'm the Interim uh, Assistant Public Works Director currently. Um, in terms of our EOC, we currently have uh, an EOC uh, that we use here at the building on the third floor in the conference room. Um, it doesn't meet the class four uh, classification currently. Um, there is some seismic upgrades to the facility. When this building was upgraded and we expanded, um, half of the building is seismically ready. Uh, the other half, it doesn't meet all the um, uh, requirements of a class four. So. Yes. Yeah, well, yeah, which half is it? We're in the old side, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, and not to do too deep of a dive on this. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Class four. I'm I'm familiar with the standards. I've, I worked on a hospital project and sure. OSHPOD standards, and I I, re I recognize that those are a different level. Is is this class four? Is that level? Is that or is it? Or fire? I heard fire stations and police to headquarters are built to those standards too. Yeah, the, the OSHPOD metric is separate. So this is actually within the seismic design criteria code. So it's, it's, it's a 
it's this it's a structural it's from a structural perspective that um what is the exact language it's it's it was it's within the cbc yeah so it's it's straight up building code and there are different delineations of structural Precisely. risk categories okay this is the best one is there a five To be clear, you know, the other categories are safe buildings. You know, you if there is an event, you will be able to to leave and not, you know, not have it fall down on you. The the uh, the the, deline the difference is that for two and three, you would need to have the building unoccupied and inspected and perhaps repaired before you could use it again. Whereas four means, you know, aside from a very quick visual inspection, you can go right back in and press the button and start using your equipment. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. And then I had a similar question as Council Member Darling on the budget. I wasn't sure how the changes resulted in a savings seemingly of 1.37 million. Um, the, the on page 15 of the staff report. Okay. And it's for the essential services category. Right, Th you take the 1.77 held on page two from the conceptual design and subtract the staff recommended portion. Prices aren't listed there, but I did say they're roughly 200K per level. And that's, what you're, that's, the, that's the savings that you've got, 1.77 minus. So was it overestimated in 2023? Thank you, Janine. Yes, <laughs> is, the, is the right answer. And, and it has to do with, um, having no real clear scope about what we meant by that. And some of the other things that you could do to make this a more robust EOC exceed the 1.77. So it seemed like this covers you. You know, if you, for instance, wanted to have a backup, backup plumbing so that regardless of what happened to the grid, you would have running water that could be disposed <coughs> of on site. That's not something typ typically you find in EOCs and would be far more expensive than was held for the 1.77. So we, we looked at, you know. And they have a whole swimming pool right there. <laughs> Just give them like water pond. filters. <laughs> and a canal. Yeah. Thank you. Canal might be better. OK. Um, I don't see any more questions. And. Is there anything more that staff so, wants? So Janine is going to wrap up, and then we'll turn it back to council and, and public then we'll, comment. Then we'll do public yep. comment. Thank okay. You. Thanks. Oops. Um, so just to summarize the staff recommendations for this evening, um, that's uh, this slide here represents the uh, options that are recommended for aquatics essential services and sustainability, and it compares it to what's in your uh, in the current schematic design on the left-hand side. We can come um, back to this again, it's, but it just summarizes everything in this one slide. Um, and one of the things that we wanted to point out is that the project team is currently working on a cost estimate for the schematic design um, package. And in so doing, there are a number of items that have come up, both construction costs and soft costs that are pr cost pressures on the project budget. Um, and those were items that weren't anticipated um, when the 77 million, uh, million budget was accepted. So this list is some of those items. For example, the first in the list, the natural lake remediation, um, that's a mitigation measure. That's now we, now we know that that's a requirement as a result of reducing the size of the man-made pond. Um, in addition, we've been looking at a lot of these um, more soft costs in more detail, um, such as the permit processing times. Um, I think initially those were anticipated um, to maybe be more streamlined than is typical in a process. So these are a number of um, costs that we will continue to monitor and if necessary, we will come back to you if there's any additional budget allocations that are required. But at this time, we are doing our best to, to monitor and um, monitor these and stay within the budget to the best of our capability. 
The next steps are if council approves the recommended options as proposed, we will come we will continue with the next phase of the project, which is the design development phase. Otherwise, if any modifications to those options are requested, then we'll need to come back and we'll stay within the schematic design phase. And those may have additional impacts to the budget, scope, and schedule. So in conclusion, the action recommended this evening is to approve the recommended modified options listed below. So for the aquatics, it's to implement the April 10th aquatic schematic design package. For the sustainability, it's to approve the lead silver equivalent. And for the essential services, it's to upgrade 100% of the building to an operational EOC. And that concludes our presentation. Oh, yeah. Clarification on the sustainability option. Staff and the design team are recommending what we would call option three. Let me confirm. Yes. Is that correct? Option three. Yes. yes. The one that's got a big black line around it. Okay. <laughs> I'll leave it here. Thank you. I had one quick question. Sorry. On the um, phasing of building demolition, are we st are we looking at demolition and then issuing the contract for construction, or are we issuing those together, or have we decided yet? There's still a little bit of, of um, processing to do with the environmental impact assessment, but currently we are planning demolition of the building first, the pond work second, and then the main project last. Okay. And as part of the demolition, would that include the excavation of the pool area so that you can use that as part of pond remediation, or is that not working? That hasn't been decided yet. Okay. Good. It's okay. You're not the only one. Um, so I, we are at the moment when we open this to public comment, and if anybody is up for it, um, just the person I was hoping would come and share with us. Thank you. Council members, Mike Heaney from Walnut Creek Aquatic Foundation. I just wanted to come tonight to reiterate our support for the proposed design changes to the aquatic facility. And most of all, thank everybody who's been involved in this process for so long uh, for all their time, energy, and concern for your communities. And uh, we look forward to a continued partnership. You got more time if you want it. No, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Can we use some of your time though? Yeah. And just say thank you for the Aquatics Foundation. I know you guys had to do a lot of work in the last month to put together working with the staff. And I really appreciate the effort that you guys have put into this. Yeah. It's a pleasure working with you guys. Mm -hmm. Any, any other comments back here, Ray? No, except yes, thank you very much. It made a difference, made our days happier. Um, okay, N no more public comment? No more public comment. So we're back to council input, I believe. Acting city manager. Uh, that's correct. So the what you see in front of you is the recommendations from staff for council. If you'd like to take these one at a time, that's fine. If you want to do the whole package at once, that's exactly. But I'm um, happy to answer more questions if you have any or um, take your comments and direction. Thank you. Um, Council Member Francois. Uh, well, first of all, I, you know, I'd like to kick, it, kick off by thanking staff, everybody on the Arts and Rec staff, uh, Kevin, obviously, Karen, the whole team, uh, you know, our consultant team, and certainly want to thank the Aquatics Foundation. Uh, this is uh, um, a contrast from the last meeting and a, and a pleasant contrast. I think it, it shows when kind of we listen to one another and we roll up our sleeves and sit down and try to work on solutions. It's pretty amazing what we can accomplish. So I'm, I'm really pleased uh, that we're at this point and really happy uh, to move forward. I'm happy to make a motion now or later, but I, 
I will be supporting um, the staff recommended options. I think the logic on each of them made sense to me. Uh, I think it, it, on the pool, we're, we've reached a consensus in, with the Aquatics Foundation and honored our commitment to meet the, the programming needs of the teams, which is very important, as well as balancing that with our community needs. So I think we've certainly checked that box and, and taken care of my very favorite aqua nuts uh, with some additional deep water space for them while still allowing the aqua bears to do their long course swimming. Um, on the sustainability, um, the recommendation made sense to me that you know the roof can only support so many arrays at this point and at, at some point that battery storage is coming and that by doing the staff recommended option we're not foreclosing ourselves from taking advantage of that. Uh, hope, hopefully it comes in the near future. And on the, the ECO, I, it, I definitely think that we need a facility that's not just 50% built to that standard, but 100% built to the standard. And so um, each of the recommendations made sense to me and I think is the appropriate course to, to move forward. And I'm, gl I'm really glad that we were able to do this uh, in a, a quick amount of time too. I know the city manager is watching and would be too that we we were able to accomplish this really in at about a month's time so and not really lose any time because we're having the sustainability conversation now so great job everyone and thank you very much yes please kevin all right uh i would agree with that uh basically everything council member francois said I, I'm so glad to see the compromise, the solution that were worked out here. It really does balance what, what we were hearing from the swimming community, and that was all of the swimming programs, and what we know was needed with our, our community at large, which are paying the bulk of the, the cost for all of this. Here we started this several years ago. We were able to uh, pass Measure O, and it's just it's just terrific to be able to see that we've come to an arena now where we really seem to have been able to provide um, the best options for the groups that we've been discussing this with. Uh, and, and hearing what everyone wanted to make sure that they got their points on and that we could agree upon. Uh, so I'm happy we've come to a consensus on that regarding the aquatics. When it comes to sustainability, as I was looking at everything over the course of the last several days on the report, it occurred to me we can't solve everything on the sustainability right now. And just like technology and just like improvements that happen as well, there are going to be lower costs and more efficiencies, and, uh, and we're going to see new improvements that come that future councils down the road will be able to take advantage of and save costs at that point as well. As I, I can't remember which, which was the council member that said this on another topic several years ago, we can't boil the ocean. But we can certainly make a lot of solutions to get to that point where there, we will be setting the table for those uh, councils down the road. So I'm happy we come to a, a compromise on the consensus with all this, that we have a project and a facility that we and future generations can be proud of. And I want to thank you to staff. Uh, for all of your work, and uh, I think you left out Jim, but I know that you meant to include Jim as well, but along with Karen and Kevin and, and Public Works, everybody, this, is, this has truly been a, a full team effort here, uh, along with our consultants, along with the Aquatics Foundation and the various uh, aquatics groups. Thank you for all making, finding a solution to making this work. I'm going to enthusiastically support this and all of the staff recommendations. Um, thank you. Thank you to all of you, um, members of the public, the staff, the consultants. Um, there's a song, A Long Winding Road. Um, one would have hoped that 17 years ago when I first was elected to the City Council and one of the first conversations was related to what are we going to do about the future of Clark Swim Center, that there was a straight line and a straight path, but there rarely, if ever, is. And we could, I could reiterate all of the places I've been along this long winding road, but we've learned a lot in each step and we've learned how to compromise and work together and I think that's what's really important here because we still have many, many steps to take through this process as was evidenced by that one slide that said the unknowns that are still out there. I am very supportive of 
the recommendations that have been made tonight. I appreciate the thoughtfulness, not only on how to make a balanced approach truly feasible and the aquatic solution, but also what we can do on the sustainability front to be ready to be poised when the future, the true future arrives, and also to ensure that we have a operational emergency operations center because disasters, we've had disasters. It's not only been flood, but we've suffered from fires. Not close, but you don't have to be close to suffer from the smoke from Paradise Fire or Santa Rosa or Napa. And so I'm pleased, pardon me? Or Oregon. Or, or, well, yeah, that's true. Um, I think we're in the right place and I look forward to being able to do this and setting the stage for a very long future in our community. Thank you. And I similarly thank everybody. I think everybody really worked hard to get us to tonight. Um, but I'm the new kid on the block, so I'm just looking forward. We've mm -hmm. got, you know, we're gonna be looking at the, the next design phase you know, next year. There's a lot that's gonna, the unknowns are in there. And so I really wanna emphasize what, how we got here tonight was strong communication, shared understanding of each other's interests and how they can be met by this project. And I wanna see that continued close collaboration but with the Aquatics Foundation, with the Sustainability Committee, with everybody that's got an interest in this project. And I know you guys will do that. That's why we picked you. Um, I think the one challenge I would like to leave is that with sustainability, it is, it is a fast evolving process and it offers significant federal cost sharing now as the Inflation Reduction Act gets, I mean, we're putting PVs on, on there. We have the opportunity to get the credits for those. So it's incumbent upon us to become conversant in that as the federal government clarifies what the heck they mean when they say they can give cities money. It's like, oh, okay, sounds good. Um, and then take that knowledge and then look for opportunities to turn this into thinking about it not just as a capital cost, but an investment into a long-term operating regime that is more efficient and lower cost for the city. You know, looking at that, um, as the mayor said, what's your payback period and how, when is it to that point where, yes, it's worth it and ready time to pull the, the plug. So I'm not sure if that's next April when you guys come back with the next design phase or somewhere in here. So I, I don't know if I stare at you guys or we stare at you April. guys. Uh, next April, 2025, that's the next phase. <laughs> you got a whole nother year till we come back to this. But uh, I would like to see some additional analysis of this as an enterprise. We have batteries, we have solar, we have the opportunity to offset our own costs, the opportunity to market excess energy to those that are willing to pay for it and, and look and see if there's a way to create some value out of the proposition because we might not be quite there yet, but things are changing fast in the field, so. Okay, I guess I should thank you. Um, because you made my day. Um, you, you really did put together something where everybody can walk away. Um, I think I was talking to our... Uh, to acting. I can't remember again. I'm, it, it's my cold. Um, acting uh, mayor. And I said, sometimes under pressure, better things happen than if the pressure hadn't applied. And... Um, and then along the way, everybody gets really upset with it. It gets personal. It gets um, frustrating. It, it looks like it's never going to happen. And then all of a sudden, like a giant balloon that you stick a pin in, somebody says the right thing somehow, some way. And I don't know who to give credit for everybody. I bet you all have... Um, your own little balloons that you popped and then found the big balloon that made it all happen. I really appreciate it. Um, the thing that makes me most excited is the practical, which is we have needed an, uh, a, a community center, a current operation, emergency operation center. And in all of the problems that we had getting here, I think we kind of never even paid attention 
to how much this community needs something that we will every day get up and pray that we will never need, but when we do, we have it. And so um, it, makes, it makes me feel better that we have taken care of that. That was very special. Uh, I think the pools are going to be sweet, um, and, and more people are going to enjoy swimming, and you're going to think of new ways to use them, and uh, this creativity, I think, will pay the, in, inevitably pay great dividends to our community, and so thank you all for hanging in there and finding the solution. I believe there is a, a potential nomin nominee for a motion. Madam Mayor, I, I'd be very pleased to um, move the staff recommended options in terms of the aquatics option, implementing the April 10th, 2024 aquatic schematic design package on the sustainability option, approving the lead silver equivalent with support for future add-on features and on the essential services option, upgrading 100% of the new building to operational EOC capability. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second, and I now need a roll call vote, please. Councilmember Francois. Aye. Councilmember Wilk. Aye. Councilmember Silva. Aye. Mayor Potem Darling. Aye. Mayor Haskew. With a giant smile, yes, aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, we did it. You did it. It is now uh, ready to move on, and this gives me the right to adjourn the meeting to the next regular meeting on May 7th.